Good afternoon. My name is Jason Chavez, and I'm the chair of the Committee of the Whole. I'm going to call to order our regular committee meeting for Tuesday, February 6th. At this time, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll to verify the presence of a quorum. <laughs> Council Member Payne. Present. Wansley. Present. Rainville. Present. Vita. Present. Ellison. Here. Osman. Present. Cashman. Present. Jenkins. Present. Chugtai. Present. Koski. Present. Palmasano. Present. Vice Chair Chowdhury. Present. Chair Chavez. Present. There are 13 members present. Thank you. I'll let the record reflect that we have a quorum. We have six items on the public agenda today in addition to our reports of committees that have met this cycle. Item number one is an update from community organizers at Captain Nakasi who will not be presenting today. After two evictions last week, they are exhausted and focused on getting as many people as housed as possible, so we're going to move on to item number two. Discussion item number two is a report concerning a comparative analysis of TNC minimum compensation models. This item was forwarded to this committee from the Business, Housing, and Zoning Committee. I'll invite Andrew Hawkins to give a presentation of this item. And we can wait for staff. Otherwise, we can just move on to discussion item number three, if the clerks can help me with that. Oh, there we are. Perfect. Thank you so much, Andrew. My apologies, I had to wait for emergency, so we're all good. It's all okay. Just for members of the Committee of the Whole, please, we have speaker management, um, and you can start getting on cue as you have questions. We'll take uh, questions um, or discussion after Mr. Hawkins presents. All right. Uh, Chair Chavez, members of the committee, my name is Andrew Hawkins from the City Auditor's Office of Policy and Research. Uh, I'm here today to present on our analysis of the transportation network uh, companies, um, or also known as rideshare, uh, compensation rate model analysis. Uh, to begin with just a little bit of background, uh, the state of Minnesota defines TNCs as a corporation, partnership, sole proprietorship, or other entity that is operating in Minnesota and uses a digital network to connect transportation network company riders to transportation network company drivers who provide prearranged rides. Uh, it's a pretty standard definition across all the places we look at, uh, but these would, you know, I think traditionally be known as, you know, the Ubers and Lyfts uh, that we see operating in, um, in, you know, most major U.S. cities. Um, on November 18th, uh, the Minneapolis Business Inspections Housing and Zoning Committee uh, approved a legislative directive uh, to our office to take a look at three different models. Uh, these three models had come forward through a variety of, um, I think, avenues. Uh, the initial one uh, matched what had been put together by the um, city's uh, community planning and economic development office uh, and presented to the city council um, in last year's cycle. Uh, model B reflects, I think, kind of a mix of what was brought forward by Uber and Lyft at the state level. Uh, some of it builds on what was done initially and adopted by the state of Washington. Um, and then model C is one that I think has been explo explored kind of in essentially, you know, every city that's looked at this has tried to figure out what's the easiest way to do this. Obviously, you know, as we're going to get into this, the thing that's going to be abundantly clear is that this is a very complex uh, calculation required to come, you know, to, uh, you know, like, like to come to any, you know, like, I think, agreement on, you know, what the compensation is based on per mile, but, you know, what's more important per mile per minute. Um, and so everywhere is kind of tried to look at, you know, like, is there any way to just do this with a flat rate? Um, I do want to note some qualifiers before I continue. Um, again, compensation rate models are based on data that's gathered through a combination of source and survey data. In the absence um, of compensation rate models being informed directly from the source data, uh, which would be, you know, more often than not, the rideshare companies themselves, um, it's important to note that these models are determined using the best information that's available. Um, as a result, it's necessary to conduct a continued assessment to ensure that models and rates can be adapted uh, to account for any changes um, in the data sources or the data itself. 
Again, that qualifier, it kind of goes along with the idea of bad data in, bad data out. If there's something that changes, you know, our f fundamental assumptions need to change with it as well. Um, I think we've seen this, you know, ac across the board at, you know, at the state and local levels where they've adopted, you know, some kind of a model and that model's been continuously uh, monitored and, you know, adapted to make sure that it's meeting the needs and its intended purpose. Um, really quickly, just to go over the legislative timeline, um, some of the background, which again, I'm, this one I'm sure many of you know. Uh, uh, this was um, last year's cycle when it came before biz um, in May, um, ended up being adopted, was subsequently vetoed, um, and then uh, uh, the, 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 the council was unable to override the veto. Um, as I touched on on the previous slide, the rate that was agreed to at that time was uh, $1.40 per mile uh, and 51 cents per minute. Um, one thing you will notice in some of the calculations in this analysis is that we actually did go up to 52 cents a minute. The reason that was done was to account for the city's new minimum wage um, that was adopted on January 1 of uh, this year. At the same time this was happening at the city level, this, uh, a similar effort was also taking place at the state level. Um, again, that same kind of May through December timeline. Uh, the Minnesota House um, on May 18th established their protections for uh, transportation network company drivers. Uh, this was approved through the Minnesota State Senate um, a, a few days later um, and actually established $1.45 per mile and 34 cents per minute um, for trips beginning within the seven county metro area. Um, if, if you expand that to the statewide, so anything outside of that seven county metro, it was $1.25 per mile and 34 cents per minute. Um, this bill was subsequently vet vetoed by Governor Walz, um, and they established a governor's committee on compensation. Sorry, it's a very long title, but they essentially a committee to uh, look into this and uh, report back to the governor um, and the, leg the legislature around um, some of their recommendations. Uh, the report was issued on December 30th um, out of this group. Um, however, with regard to compensation, the only thing that was really established was that a minimum compensation per ride of $5.00. Um, was was recommended by the group. There was nothing pertaining to a set minimum wage for, per mile, a set minimum wage per minute, um, which I know was, I think, something that um, kind of all of the groups involved in this were hoping there'd be some guidance that would come out of that group that could sort of be used and built upon um, for subsequent efforts that are taking place here, both here right now and at the state level. Um, we, you know, we, they'll more than likely be discussed this cycle as well. Getting into the model rate calculations. Uh, the first thing to understand uh, for this topic is um, what these definitions mean, since that's sort of what the basis for uh, you know where all the calculations begin and end. Um, the various stages are stage P1, P2, and P3. Um, P1 reflects when a driver is logged into an app and is active, um, but is not on their way to either pick up a rider or actively transporting a rider. This could be you've logged onto the app and you're driving from your home, uh, you know, to again if you are picking people up downtown or that's going to be where you're going to work. That evening, uh, you know, you're you're on the way from wherever you live to there. Uh, P2 is where you are actively uh, on your way to pick up a rider um, who has you know used the app to request uh, a ride to a destination. And then P3 is once that rider has entered your vehicle, and you are actively transporting them uh, to the location uh, that they've identified. Um, it's also important to note that I think for P1, um, in most cases, again, at least based on you know the information we, I was able to review. Um, this is also where the individual might be logged into the app, but they're, as far as from an insurance standpoint, should they get in an accident or anything, this is where they would generally be covered by their own, um, and where they, the, it would not have gone into the, like, over to the company side yet, whereas when you're on the way to pick up somebody or when you're actively transporting somebody, that's where you would generally fall under the umbrella of coverage from um, whatever operator you were currently uh, providing service for. Um, to understand the model rate calculations, we looked at two cities uh, that, this, that uh, CPED staff had also identified when they were trying to determine what the best um, model for the city might look like. Uh, one of the first adopters was New York, um, and again, a big reason for this was that they had the New York Taxi and Limousine Commission. Uh, that was, I think, one of the kind of primary drivers and logical places for this to be housed under. The three factors they identified to establish rates were time, distance, and utilization. Um, so again, like time uh, uh, acknowledges for the amount of time that riders are spending in their vehicles. Distance was intended to cover, you know, like I think all of that wear and tear, you know, the, the impact that essentially the mileage is having on the vehicle and some of those intangible expenses. And then utilization uh, was necessary to determine what percentage of a driver's time is spent um, in one of the statuses, um, like, like that would be covered under the compensation. As of 2023, uh, New York uh, has two different standards. They have one for non-wheelchair accessible vehicles, one for wheelchair accessible vehicles. Uh, currently, the non-wheelchair accessible vehicle, which I think is probably the more common one, that's just you know, and, and like uh, kind of everyday, you know, like cars and SUVs, is a um, dollar um, 
roughly $1.30 or 31 cents uh, per mile and then uh, 56 cents uh, per minute. Moving into Seattle, um, so when Seattle established their rideshare compensation model, uh, they actually uh, met commissioned a fairly large study uh, that was done. The study has sort of served as, I think, one of the guiding um, like kind of pieces of research for a lot of subsequent work that's been done, both at the state level in Washington, um, here, um, and then in a number of other places that are kind of in the exploration stage um, of this process, including Chicago, I believe the state of Connecticut is also um, like looking at something. But uh, this report was from the Center of uh, New York City Affairs, um, which is a wing of the New School, um, the Center for Wage and Ec uh, Employment Dynamics, which is out of California, Berkeley. Um, the authors uh, reviewed a range of items. Uh, they looked at rideshare driver compensation. They looked at various compensation models, um, tried to determine all of the factors that go into determining you know, what, you know, what you have to account for in the course of um, you know, one of these operators undertaking the, you know, whatever their normal day looks like. Um, identifying the characteristics of rideshare trips. This can include, you know, how many trips are going from city center out of the city, how many trips are going from out of the city to into city center, how many stay within, a, you know, a single neighborhood of a city, um, you know, and then the types of vehicles because that obviously impacts things like, again, like gas mileage, um, you know, how like the um, wear and tear, things of that nature. Um, so again, like, um, as I noted previously, in the absence of you know direct data, which they they were able to obtain some, um, but you all, you need to get this data from somewhere. So this one was again, they tried to be as comprehensive as they could. Um, and there was extensive review of data from both King County, uh, the City of Seattle, uh, trip and vehicle tracking from um, current rideshare operators, uh, multiple surveys uh, that were provided to rideshare drivers, and I believe passengers in the Seattle area, um, and then that portion of data that they were um, provided by Uber. As of 2024, uh, this actually highlights, uh, again, some additional developments in Seattle, and it highlights what, uh, what essentially a municipal carve-out looks like. Uh, the state of Seattle um, has also, or sorry, the state of Washington has also adopted um, a rideshare minimum compensation rate. However, because Seattle was able to establish a rideshare compensation rate in advance of the state uh, taking action, uh, there was an agreement that there'd be a carve-out for trips, uh, both starting in Seattle and then trips ending in Seattle, but beginning somewhere else. Um, and then there's also, similar to what was proposed at the state level here, there is that um, kind of all-encompassing uh, piece for what compensation rates look like if you're completely outside of Seattle. Um, so as of 2024, it is $1.55 per mile, 66 cents per minute, um, with a minimum compensation of 581. Um, and then for outside Seattle, it's 131 um, per mile, 38 cents per minute, and then a 337 uh, minimum compensation. Uh, the one for trips ending in Seattle, but beginning outside gets a little bit complicated, uh, but essially it takes the greater of the two. So if, you, if you're picked up somewhere fairly far from Seattle and you drive all the way across the state and, and just inside the city limits, odds are that using the statewide compensation model probably provides a higher rate of compensation to the driver. However, if you're picked up you know, two blocks outside of the city and then travel several miles in the city, um, you would end up taking the Seattle rate because that would provide the higher of the two compensations. Uh, now, getting into the actual models uh, that we had before us, um, we have Model A. So uh, for this one, it, uh, the minimum compensation standard uh, for time, the easiest way to frame these is that the time compensation standard is generally tied to whatever the wage we're trying to accomplish is. Uh, so in this case, we're trying to account for the Minneapolis minimum wage. So as of 2024, that was 1557 to figure out what that looks like on a permanent basis, to divide it by 60, you get leave you uh, with almost 26 cents. Um, and that, that's where you need to figure out the percentage of a time that a driver's spending in P3 transporting, since that was uh, that the period where it was determined we'd be compensating drivers. Um, and then that needs to be scaled to account for P1 and P2 because they wouldn't be compensated there, but you still want to ensure that they're earning a minimum wage uh, for the time that they're in um, that, that active status, whether it's P1, P2, or P3. Um, so in this one, it, as far as math, uh, doing us some favors, it actually did end up being fairly uh, like simple um, based on the Seattle uh, model and where they found uh, the average time spent in P3 was and then adjusting for factors here, CPAT had determined that that was roughly 50% of a driver's time was spent in P3. Um, so again, just taking that 50% of time and accounting for the other 50% in those other statuses, um, we end up taking that 25, um, that almost 26 cents and mul multiplying it by two, which gives us 51.9, round up to 52 cents per minute. Um, per mileage, uh, minimum compensation standard, uh, this is attended, like this is again, those operational expenses, a depreciation on a vehicle, if there's, you know, if the vehicle's leased, if the vehicle's on a, you know, um, you know, purchased and there's a loan payment every month. I mean, it's all that stuff that's related to what it costs you to operate your vehicle um, for that, you know, for that company. 
Um, and as I said before, CPED considered a number of factors in this, including um, rest breaks, uh, the time that's necessary for a driver to review the offers that are presented to them, um, administrative tasks, um, availability between offers, and as far as having to commute between where you drop somebody off and where the next pickup may be. Um, and then just those reasonable expenses to operate, which were depreciation, uh, lease payment, maintenance and repair, tires, gas, insurance, vehicle registration, um, and again, just things of that nature. And so uh, where we landed in terms of adjusting for like Minneapolis, um, you know, and what those costs look like here as compared to you know, what the Seattle survey had found um, led, brought them to 140 uh, per mile. All right. Uh, having explained kind of what went into the, um, you know, the, con the calculation rate for that uh, Model A, I'm going to get into the actual comparison. Oops. Sorry. And then again, uh, apologies, I had tailored this to the biz committee. Um, so unfortunately, if, uh, if you weren't on that committee, you, your ward might not be represented. However, all of them are in the reports. Uh, the reason that this was done was to basically give, uh, yeah, I think, a more kind of tangible way to look at all of these and what the actual impact would be to expenses by using uh, rec centers um, or parks in all of your wards um, and just calculating them. Again, since most trips, kind of regardless of where they start around a metro area, end up coming downtown. I just uh, chose City Hall as a destination. Um, you know, it's also worth noting that, you know, again, these calculations are reflective of, you know, when they were calculated, uh, you know, the time of day, the traffic at that time, um, you know, the weather conditions, and, you know, everything in here is subject to change just based on all of those intangible factors. Uh, but I think that this, again, was, was a useful exercise because it does um, actually point out um, a couple different areas where you can see, you know, how the different models um, will impact drivers, um, you know, in a variety of ways. So um, starting off with uh, Councilmember Osmond and Councilmember Ellison's ward, um, I think the biggest thing with this one you'll see is that uh, the trip from Ward 5 is actually shorter um, distance-wise, but it's a little bit longer minute-wise. Um, that's where you're going to see any model that factors in time. Um, is going to come out at a higher degree of compensation, even though the trip itself was not, um, you know, I mean, and I understand it's a very small difference, but wasn't uh, quite as long. Oops. Um, and our next example for Councilmember Rainville and Councilmember Cashman, um, with this one, uh, I think this is actually a good, a good one to look at just for the impact of, you know, kind of as, as easy as it is to calculate where models see that flat rate um, can kind of fall a little short. Um, is the fact that it doesn't account for, you know, for distance. It's simply the amount of time that people are in that status. Um, so if you do have something where there's traffic um, or there's not traffic, you can travel a pretty high, you know, you could a much further distance without that being factored into any degree of compensation. So again, this is one where there actually is a fairly, you know, like notable difference of 1.3 miles in trips, but the trips took the same amount of time. If you're operating using that flat rate, um, I mean, what you'll see is that you're not being, you know, like that, that extra distance on uh, your vehicle is not being accounted for. And then the last one uh, with Councilmember Jenkins and Councilmember Chowdhury. Um, with this one, I think they're uh, like two kind of standalone um, like items I wanted to call out, and that was with, uh, with Ward 8 from um, Martin Luther King Jr. Park to City Hall. This one, uh, there were a variety of ways to get here. Uh, there's surface streets, there's 35. It just depends on traffic conditions, and this was one where you know, playing around with it based on, you know, I actually went back to check my math um, and did the route again, and it mapped it a different way um, because it could change quite a bit. So there's some of these where they can vary a lot. Um, and you can see, you know, like sometimes there'll be many more miles, but, you know, much shorter time-wise, and sometimes they're going to be, you know, much shorter mileage um, and shorter time. It just, it, 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 so much of this is dependent on the geography of where you're trying to go um, and what, um, you know, and, and what's available as far as service streets versus, uh, you know, major thoroughfares, interstates, highways. Um, on that note, uh, Ward 12 was notice, uh, like notable because this is was one of the longer trips um, that we were able to calculate, so to see kind of what this might look like on the higher end. Um, I think this is actually a fairly good example. Another thing that's worth noting, just from an enforceability standpoint, um, is Highway 62. Um, so this one, I think, gave me, again, a couple different options uh, for the purposes of this discussion. I just mapped it on 62 um, and chose that route. And again, uh, like under the assumption that that would be compensated the whole time as part of Minneapolis. However, there are parts of 62 that, again, the, um, like this would have to be checked with, you know, um, I don't know, like GIS and mapping, but where it, I think 62 does pop out of the city even very briefly. And so I think trying to determine how we account for that um, from an enforceability standpoint and how that's measured is something that's I, I did want to note. And to my conclusions. Um, so as you've seen, uh, each of these models, I think, has the potential. If, if the goal of this is minimum, is, you know, bringing people up to a minimum wage standard, I think that, you know, it is, 
it is possible. So I mean, just to lay that out, uh, you know, from what we've looked at, I think each of them can potentially bring a driver there, but there's a lot of intangible factors that may or may not be accounted for. Um, you know, with Model A, this one, def this you know, from looking at, from getting to meet with CPED and understanding how they went through their processing, how they did their calculations, um, everything seems to you know be consistent with what was produced out of you know Seattle, um, New York, and some of the other places as far as just what they what the weighted factors were on getting us to a number that's supposed to be reflective of our community and what the you know what the costs are here. Um, I mean, this one also did it, you know, it, it consistent. It did consistently produce the highest compensation amounts. But um, as I kind of noted previously, there's you know it's still you know as far as where it falls in the scale between us, New York, uh, what was the being pro uh, proposed at the state level. I don't think it's anything that's wildly outside of um, any of those uh, models that that have been implemented or proposed elsewhere. Um, Model B produced outcomes that I think will bring drivers in the minimum compensation rate, um, but I think more information on the formulation um, is, is needed. This one came forward from Uber and Lyft at the state level. Um, one of the issues I think was um, when these were talked about, uh, some of this was calculated determining what like average wages were um, in P2 and P3, but it didn't account for P1 at all, um, which sort of rules, you know, kind of takes out this factor of I think it was like 30% of driver's time. Um, and so it kind of artificially can inflate um, what the actual earnings amount like er, earnings amount would be, um, but again, it's one where I think that you know depending on the amount of rides and where the rides are being um, you know picked up and dropped off at, I mean it, it could potentially do it, but it's just it, there's more. I think there's more that's necessary. Also, the mileage rate on that one, I believe, is 117, um, which was the mileage rate that was adopted by I think the state of Washington um, broadly in terms of the statewide mileage reimbursement rate, and I think since that point it's been updated a couple times. So even that rate now uh, from like at least the Washington side. Mm -hmm. Um, has gone up, I think, 15 cents or so. Um, and it's, I think, a little bit closer to what was being proposed at the state level here. And then Model C, again, I, I respect the simplicity of it, but it's just this is, there's not a lot about these calculations. That's ex extremely simple. Uh, there's, you know, again, it's so much of it depends on, you know, on the, the amount of time being spent, the time of day being spent, the type of vehicle that, you know, just that, I think, you know, like trying to capture that all in just a flat rate, um, there's kind of, I think, does leave, you know, leaves us open for, you know, some areas that aren't going to be accounted for. And then lastly, yeah, just uh, repeating some of the guidance from, you know, some of these places that have implemented these policies, and that's just, again, establishing a timeline. Um, for any model that's adopted to be continuously reviewed. Um, I think in a lot of the places, you know, there were, like, they, they were calculated, I think, you know, generally going up, and I didn't come across anywhere they went down dramatically, but I think figuring out what that balance looks like between per mile compensation and per minute compensation, um, you know, and in order to achieve the, the desired outcome is something that you know, I think people can spend a long time chasing to get that, you know, perfect. Um, Allowing for adjustments to be made, um, just where things aren't functioning as intended. Like you saw in some of the examples, you know, if there's, you know, again, like, like you know, if how routes are assigned, how routes are chosen, there's a lot of intangible factors where that you know I don't know if they fall within the scope of the city to uh, yeah like to dictate. Um, but I but I think from an enforcement side, it's something that needs to be monitored because routes can be you know updated and modified to accomplish a variety of things. Sometimes good, sometimes potentially not. Um, and then lastly, yeah, just like, identifying any additional impacts um, you know, that are weighing in on this you know, to achieve the desired outcomes. And so that's something as simple as road closures. Um, so if the period of time that we're going to look at involves, I mean, if we go back a few years to when 35 was closed, I mean, essentially, you know, the validity of any data that was gathered during that period would be kind of suspect because, you know, like our major, you know, one of the major arteries in and out of downtown was no longer, you know, was not operational or when it was, it was, you know, bumper to bumper traffic, which might not be this, you know, the case, you know, in most, uh, you know, most of the day. So just again, there's all that to say, there's, there's definitely a lot to this, but based on my analysis, uh, you know, I think all of these are worthy of consideration and the work that was done by CPED is certainly reflective um, of efforts that have been undertaken and adopted um, by the municipalities and states. Uh, with that, I will stop talking and stand for questions. Thank you for that presentation, Andrew. Is there any discussion? Oh, <laughs> uh, Councilmember Osman. Uh, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. Um, I think here Model A is the one that makes the most sense to me as the state of New York and city of Seattle have adopted um, over $1.55. Cents. Do we know for the public um, what the actual rate is now for the TNC? Uh, 
what are they really paying the drivers? I heard um, 58 cents a mile, and um, that is nothing close to the city minimum wage. If I calculate it, it's somewhere close to $5 an hour. Uh, do we have any idea or any data to collect that information? Um, Councilmember Osmond, I've, uh, I've certainly seen similar uh, findings. A lot of this was, I think, produced both at the city level and also um, as supporting documentation or public statements that were given uh, that, that are included in the amended report um, uh, when this was being looked at the House level. Uh, there was some data I know that Uber had provided that was showing, you know, I think that the effort was to show that over two, um, you know, two week periods that, I, again, I'm not sure how they were selected. But that way, you know, that every driver was uh, coming in above minimum wage. However, the issue with the way that the calculation works, and this is something where um, there's multiple studies that look at um, you know, how how to best account for this. But when you're only calculating things on P2 and P3, it eliminates all any of that time that's still technically you know, it's I don't want to say even work adjacent. It's still work related. Where if you're driving from your house to downtown Minneapolis and you're in P1 because you're logged in, you're just not carrying anybody that time's essentially ruled out so you're taking anywhere from 30 to 40 percent of, of a driver's hour based on the utilization rate that they were looking at and not factoring that in so it's basically saying that you know for the 40 minutes that you you know that, that you were earning money like we're just going to remove the other 20 minutes and, ex and expand that rate out so i think that's why it's it's there's a lot of ways i think that these numbers can come forward and be presented um so as far as having like a true compensation rate it's tough um but i have seen the same numbers that you have and i do think it's i mean it's certainly at this point at least not um, at the rate that we're looking at. Thank you so much. That is uh, what we have heard uh, from the drivers for uh, uh, almost two years now that as we talk to them. Uh, last question, you talk about the enforceability standpoint. How does the cities like Seattle enforce this kind of law, knowing you know, the boundaries of city of Minneapolis, uh, how would that look like in the city of Minneapolis if we adopt this policy? Yeah, um, so with that one, again, I want to make sure I don't venture too far into territory that I think is probably reserved for the city attorney to speak to. But, um, you know, I think the differences in the two, you know, New York obviously had a very well-established uh, taxi and limousine commission um, that was, I think, was kind of leveraged to um, do some of the enforcement. In Washington State, there is an outside entity. Uh, the, I know Seattle had some enforcement ability with um, their, their labor standards group, uh, but there's also a, I'm, you have to pardon me, I'm forgetting, I'm spacing on the name of it, but it's at, like a driver resource center. But there was another group that was going to be like the, essentially meant to serve as a contact point for drivers, um, and they would be investigating, um, you know, the claims. As close as I'll get to any more expansion on that before I stop and just say this is for the city attorneys is, you know, I think that one of the challenges we'd have with, uh, or you could face is with any disputes on geography um, because the only way to verify that would be through actual GPS data. You just tell me to stop at any point if I'm, uh, <laughs> um, you know, I, I, there, there's, that, that is the only way. I mean, if you have a driver that says, you know, I was, I was in Minneapolis this entire day, I never left the city limits, and then you have a company that says, like, it's not true. You know, you were outside of the city for 50% of your day. How, you know, I, I, what, what's the, I think figuring out what's, our, what's the mechanism and vehicle for remedying that issue. Because, you know, I think from, from looking at this, I think it really is. It's like having that GPS data is really the only way. Uh, to verify where a driver was, and if you don't, if, if there's a any, you know, if, if there's any contention about whether or not that data should become public or the city's entitled to it, then that's where I think we go um, outside of any of my purview and into the legal realm. Thank, thank you. I, I do want to appreciate your presentation and make a comment that this work uh, from Councilmember um, Wansley and uh, Jason in my office has had so many uh, uh, staff that worked on it, and uh, this is some models that I think kind of put us forward to finally uh, stand up and put a policy for other cities uh, like New York and Seattle has adopted, and um, I appreciate your uh, that clear presentation. Thank you. Chair. Uh, real quick, too, and thank you, Council Member Osman. I, like, I forgot, I'd be, I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, just extend my uh, thank you and um, appreciation for Max and Amy from CPED. Uh, they were very, for, again, they were very transparent and open uh, from the, you know, from the second I reached out on this one, um, as far as, you know, like what went into these calculations um, and what kind of, the, what the goal was and what kind of brought us to where we're at. So it, it could have been it very, you know, it very easily could have been contentious. It wasn't. Um, so I think it just, it makes it a lot easier from our side when, you know, we're able to work together like that. Thank you. Councilmember Palmasano. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, allow me to be a little more skeptical of this work than Council Member Osman. Um, I think we all have the same goals here. At the very beginning of your PowerPoint, you mentioned qualifiers um, and that you were using information that was the best information available. Um, last November, we were offered the data from Uber and Lyft, is my understanding. Um, did you use that in these calculations? Did you speak with Uber and Lyft directly? On this one, uh, Council Member Pomisano, we did not. We used the data that um, was available to, or the, the data that was utilized by CPED and the data that was utilized by the Seattle study. So um, as far as what was presented to the city, um, I wasn't, I'm not aware of any, car, like, any like, I guess, large data trove that was extended. That'd be unique if we were, because uh, it didn't happen anywhere else. Um, I did get the data that Uber shared with the city in the, the two calculations of the windows of time. Um, where they showed compensation models that they felt were in, um, in excess of oh, what would be our minimum wage. And th those were the ones where taking those and adjusting for the fact that they excluded P1 um, was the only, I think, real you know, ability we have. I had to work directly with the Uber data. So, um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I see that you amended your report, or I don't know that I saw an earlier version of this report, but at the very end of the report, um, you have that same sample data provided, and it shows yep. that drivers in the samples given to us by rideshare data that's local, that's here in Minneapolis mm -hmm. and not in Seattle, it shows that these drivers are compensated, yes, in P2 and P3, well over the minimum wage, um, and usually closer to, um, well, I'm sure you probably know better than I do, um, in terms of the I mean, it's pretty obvious the bar graphs are a lot closer to $30 an hour. Um, how, do you, how do you reconcile these two things? I think with that one, as with a lot of these um, studies, I think they are, you know, like there's, a, there's pieces of data that are provided, but in the absence of everything, which I also do understand and acknowledge that's you know, a, maybe a high bar for you know, an, an organization to just open up everything and share everything they have. But I think that's why so much of this is based on, um, you know, like, like the surveys and a lot of it's, again, what, even just anecdotal data. Because um, with that one, I think without knowing what the time spent in P1 was, it makes it really, really hard to figure out. Um, I mean, I think, A, the periods of time that were chosen, uh, like not knowing the background for, like, why those were chosen. Were there, you know, were there events downtown? Was there something that was driving, um, you know, like more drivers down here? Were they, you know, like, were they surging in terms of prices? Um, and from, this, from the driver survey data that's been done in a number of other localities, um, generally I th believe that P1, uh, the amount of time that's spent in P1 can be anywhere from like 30 to 40%. Um, and then the P3 is usually like I think around 50. Uh, and then the time spent in P2 is actually fairly short. Uh, that usually the reason for that's like pretty straightforward. It's that you know, they're assigning drivers that are closest to the individuals that they need to pick up. Um, so that's why with that one, like it's again, like, well, it, like it, what it shows is encouraging. It's really, really hard to assign any, you know, potential validity or extrapolate out what's not accounted for in that because of that missing P1 data. And so again, if it's, a, if the city adopts a policy of, you know, the, the P2, P3 only, then I think it'd be easier to transpose onto this. But if the goal, um, and again, I think that was kind of one of the things I tried to reiterate is that looking at this through the lens of, you know, the work that was done by the city and what the intended goal of the initial, you know, CPED analysis and what was adopted was to make sure that we were compensating for the entirety of the hour. Um, and so without having the P1 data for that, it's uh, obviously challenging to figure out what, what parts might be missing. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I think it also is additionally complicated, and I'm not sure how you would sort out a, a driver being on two apps at the same time um, during some of that latent time. Um, but uh, you do have as one of your qualifiers that you need to conduct continued assessment to make sure the models and rates can account for changes in data. And I guess I'm asking if, if to have the actual raw data from Uber and Lyft as they have allegedly offered our city, would that mean that you would suggest we continue to assess it? I think in the event that you know, like more data is always better. Uh, the more that it can inform what we're doing um, from looking, you know, looking at some of the other places that have done this. I don't, I you know, like have not seen anywhere where it was just, you know, here's everything. It was usually, you know, here's a part of this. You know, I think for the Seattle one, I think Uber provided a couple pieces, Lyft, I don't know 
either wasn't responsive or declined uh, to provide. So, you know, I think it's a conversation that's worth continuing to have. Um, you know, if, you know, I think from an enforcement side, access to the data is fairly huge, um, just because that's really one of the only ways to verify where people, you know, are actually at as f in terms of identifying when we're able to compensate them at the rate that we've established within our geographical boundaries. Um, but, you know, for any, like, long, you know, ongoing assessment, I think that's where, you know, the, like, it's probably even more critical because again, if this is something that we implement um, and then it, we're, you know, we do plan to revisit to ensure that it's having the desired impact, um, you know, like should any of the companies claim that that's not actually the case, that's where, you know, like having that discussion is impossible unless we're able to sit down and go over actual real, you know, real time data and see, you know, what the compensation rates were, how long people are on P1. Um, you know, I, I don't know how you account for both apps. That's definitely, I don't know, if, like, you know, in terms of getting in for the policies of each individual company, if that's something that they're able to dictate or control. But um, again, I think all of those are, like, like as I kind of, I stated a couple times in this, there's a lot of intangibles mm -hmm. um, and things that are, you know, with data or without are very hard to account for. So I think, you know, in, in that case, all that we're able to do is to proceed kind of using some of the... I think, you know, I think the guidance that we've, you know, we're able to take from, and this is, I think, this, the approach that CPED took is, you know, from some of the places that have been able to implement this with, you know, again, like some degree of success um, across the country. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Palmasano, Council President Payne. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my questions are pretty similar to Councilmember Palmasano's. It's kind of I think you've already answered one of my questions was to what extent did you have access to TNC data? And it sounds to me that one of the platforms offered a subset of data that maybe presented a more favorable story based on the data that they provided. But um, I'm curious in terms of just even the incentives. Like, so, you know, the fundamental innovation of these platforms is not a technology innovation. It's, a, it's an employment innovation. It's the ability to... Um, real-time adjust wages based on supply and demand, right? And I think that that will inherently have spikes of demand that lead to really well-compensated drivers at that narrow sliver of time. And then it will inherently have a collapse in wages when the demand is low. And so it feels to me that if the case that the platforms are presenting is that drivers are getting paid a fair wage, it would be within their best interest to be as transparent and forthright with their data as possible, but it feels that there's a bit of misinformation going on at the, you know, with, at least maybe that's not the or, original intention, because I know they, they try to claim uh, trade secrets as though some, you know, scrappy startup's going to take on Uber, which Lyft isn't going to take on Uber. Lyft is going to get destroyed by Uber. That's just going to happen. It's a scale business. And so um, it seems to me that they're intentionally not being transparent with their data so that we don't have clarity about around building a model that's based on real-time data. And we have to make some assumptions. And it seems that the assumptions that we're making seem very reasonable based on the data that we can get access to. But I'm just curious, ha have you had kind of like hard shutdowns of data requests from the platforms or are they just not responsive? Well, um, so in our conversations we having with the mayor's office, that was where the, um, and for those models that they had shared um, like were produced. So in terms of, you know, bringing in anything more uh, like into it, I think that's the discussion that is certainly, you know, available to have. Um, I know that uh, from the uh, governor's work group, I mean, that's where they got into, you know, I think everything had moved along okay but when it got into like the, you know the, the data that was available on the minimum compensation rate that was where things seemed to stagnate um and where there is uh, that contention so i think as far as how that's approached um from the city side i mean i'm definitely would love to have everything that we can just because that makes it that much easier to make and you know to conduct that analysis um as far as what was shared um in those uh, in the two graphs uh, you know it, and I, I can you know, i don't even i don't want to make assumptions of intentions i mean it could be you know very genuinely they that, that you know that was a point of pride that hey look at these two periods of time and how much people are making however just again based on just those you know that small sliver of data um there's enough pieces to it that just call into question what's not being represented if it you know if it shows a 40 hour a week it's again like you know like is that actually captured over you know or, or two week, you know like a two-week period 
or is it just you worked 30 minutes, you know, like every day for several, you know, several weeks, it's only in P1, you know, P2 and P3. So just, it, you know, again, it's, it's that where even if it is like the best intentioned, it's, it's hard to draw any, I think, kind of hard and fast conclusions, uh, you know, around that. And so I think that's why we're seeing all of these other municipalities and states that are exploring this are having to kind of build upon the work that's already been done in other places and like again it's one of those where in the absence of you know like the hard and fast data like they have to go with i mean sometimes it's anecdotal where you know it's a you know driver saying how much they've you know worked and that's why you have to continuously be willing to revisit it um you know as it again as the data changes or as more data becomes available i mean you can always go back and it, you know it can be updated accordingly yeah it seems to me that if their claim is that their drivers are consistently making above minimum wage they would be the first to reveal that data to us and they would be completely open and transparent with that data and the fact that they are being so restricted with that data i think answers the question about whether or not drivers are consistently getting paid minimum wage so thank you for bringing this forward absolutely thank you council member cashman thank you chair chavez and thank you andrew for the presentation and I especially enjoyed the kind of comparative analysis between Ward 7, Ward 3, like distance versus time spent in the car. Um, I used to drive for DoorDash so I kind of know what it's like as a driver to like pick your routes based on how much money you're going to make and I'm wondering what kind of externalities like that are anticipated or maybe arose out of you know the, the law in Seattle in terms of what drivers then choose as like their optimal route to make the most amount of money and I'm wondering, you know, this is a, maybe a different conversation, but what the user experience of that is. What can we expect if we pass this law in terms of how the riders in Uber and Lyft, um, whether the cost would change, whether the availability of drivers at different locations or different times of day would change, if there's any data about that. And then finally, uh, wondering if there's have there been any impact of third or fourth um, transportation network companies arising to compete with this to offer even beyond what's mandated in the law, like additional benefits for drivers to be even more competitive? Maybe like if a Minneapolis-based company could see an opportunity, right, to then push Uber and Lyft out of the market. I'm wondering about if you have any insights on any of that. Absolutely. Uh, Council Member Cashman, thank you. I'll, I'll try to answer all the, the different pieces as best I can. If I missed any, um, by all means, let me know, and I'll, I'll make sure I circle back. Um, in terms of the, f like, I can start kind of the last question. For, um, from what I saw in the other you know, places and from looking into these, you know, into New York, Seattle, and then again, I know Chicago is looking at this now. That um, see, obviously California is um, had a kind of more comprehensive, you know, more public, um, I think, you know, battle for lack of a better term. Um, I haven't seen any where there's been like a, at least any you know moderately large you know like large impact uh, providers that have come in um, in space that's been created from this. Um, I mean you know you mentioned the um, the DoorDash and like those types of businesses. I think that's an adjacent piece that we've seen um, kind of follow some of this um, in some of these places and be explored in a variety of fashions, um, kind of building on some of the compensation models that they adopted for uh, the actual ride share. Um, in terms of the impact to the user, uh, I think that's one where you know, that's why the, you know, the being able to measure, you know, to measure where we're at now and where we're going is incredibly important. And that was one of the other reasons too that I thought it was important to highlight, um, just you know, the trips from the very, you know, from from each of the wards in Minneapolis is to realize, you know, where there might be, and, and like so much of it is from where something is, and you know, the access to, you know, the, the fastest route into town can make a big difference for some people, especially if the, you know people if individuals are in an area where they're very dependent. Um, you know, on a th again a third-party provider for a vehicle. Um, you know, if they're not, if it's like not as close to public transit as they might want to be, and don't have their own vehicle. Um, you know, again, this is one where there's not. You know, I don't know that there's um, you know, like ample data that's been provided to prove, you know, to establish this definitively. But I think the you know, in, as far as the charge that's taken off uh, the top from like Uber in terms of what they're um, for everything, what they're taking. I believe is around 25 percent or 20 to 25 percent from uh, some of the studies that um, that were part of that informed the Seattle uh, report, um, and I think even the Cornell report um, touches on it. So if we're looking at this solely as a minimum compensation standard, uh, again, like you could potentially extrapolate that there's 25, you know, whatever that cost is, is there going to be 25 percent more that's on the top of it? Um, because the way that these are all framed um, in either the municipal or state level is that. 
again, all that all that's being noted is that these are the minimum compensation levels. If they have, you know, if if they'd like to compensate at a higher level, they're absolutely entitled to. But like this is the minimum compensation for the actual driver. Um, so whatever they want to collect off the top of any of any any trip that the driver um, you know undergoes, um, like that would have to be factored in on top of it. So I think I, that's definitely something that needs to be monitored because there is obviously a potential you know potential impact, potential adverse impact, um, depending on you know what's done in good faith and what's you know, what's not. I think the activation rates, I don't know that we got into it at the city level as much. I know the states talked about the utilization, um, and, and I think that's another one where the enforcement side of it, I think that needs to be definitely a piece with, you know, how, to, like, you know, how is that enforced as far as, like, if drivers are getting deactivated um, in a certain area because there's either, you know, and, and what the, and I guess what the cause of that is, whether it's related to, you know, like actual real or artificial demand um so i think that's the the, the activation and utilization stuff is and it, it's hard to measure because without the actual data of just you know here's 27 you know we had this many drivers we deactivated this many in this hour and here's that data it's you know you're kind of reliant on drivers coming back um and saying like well here i was downtown at seven o'clock on friday and all of a sudden i was you know like deactivated um, you know, because they said they, they, had, they had too many people and they didn't want to pay, um, you know, like or wh whatever the claim would be. But I think that's one where figuring out what that looks like from an enforcement standpoint is something that's worth right, a conversation. Um, Chair Chavez, if I could just ask a clarifying question yeah. that on the first part that you answered yeah. with San Francisco, New York, Chicago, were you saying that there was no impact on providers as in Uber and Lyft didn't leave the market um, in you know, in response to the law? Uh, that's correct. I, there might have been one where I thought it was short term, uh, like, very, like very short term. But I know in Seattle that was, like, I think that usually precedes this, this discussion um, is, the, you know, the suggestion that if this happens, it's unsustainable and we're going to need to leave the market. Um, in the cases that I've seen, I haven't found a municipality where, you know, they implemented this and there was any kind of long term um, absence of a rideshare provider. So I think okay. in, in the absence of one, as we've talked about, there's two very big ones. So in the absence of one, I think the other one generally begins to just take up more, mar take up more market share until the other one comes in. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Rainville. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Thank you for the excellent work on this. I, I see you have a good base to keep uh, working off and what I'm hearing is you still need to flesh this out a little more, is that correct? Um, I mean, I think a lot of that's going to be up to where this goes next. I'm always happy. I mean, I'm here to serve the council. Um, so if there's more, if we, I think the biggest piece that um, is missing right now, and I don't mean missing in the sense of we can't move forward. I'm saying it's missing in the sense of uh, this is why other places have moved forward based on kind of this more, like, you know, having to fill in gaps with anecdotal data. Um, is that, you know, is that, is that, I think that, I don't know, the grand treasure trove of you know of actual real-time data that allows us to, to look at stuff and calculate it with you know a, a degree of certainty that would be much higher than you know like, like it, it could be otherwise sure and in the earlier slide where you're doing those comparisons on, on what a driver would be compensated you had said that basically from North Commons Park to City Hall a round trip would be $21 was uh, item yeah. a I think yeah one second here Um, for North Commons, I think I had uh, at uh, nine six uh, nine sixty. So for I should also um, for the you mean for Model C? No, uh, a round trip for North Commons oh. Park to City Hall and back would be twenty one dollars, roughly. So f the way that the compensation models work um, with all of these, I assumed that uh, since it only compensates during P three, this would be picking somebody up at North Commons Park and coming back to City Hall. So assuming that the driver was at City Hall and went up there and came back, it would still just be the 1058 because they wouldn't be compensated for P2, which would be on their way to pick somebody up. Um, for Model C, because that one compensates for time, uh, the, way that the, uh, the way that I calculated that one just to show what the impact would be is that um, is assuming that, again, a driver was here um, and they did, like, let's just use North Commons Park, um, they would be compensated on their way to North Commons Park. Um, as well as coming back from North Commons Park. So mm -hmm. with that one, it do, well, it doesn't account for mileage. It accounts for time spent, I believe it is, in P2 and P3. That's the one, uh, one nuance, and I apologize for not actually catching that sooner and making sure that I called it out. Um, but the compensation for both A and B, because it only compensates for that P3 status, wherever the driver is in the city, 
um, they're not being compensated until that um, passenger's in their vehicle. So, I mean, again, to use the Ward 12 example, because it was a bit longer of a drive, if they were all the way down there and they drove all the way to North Commons Park to pick somebody up, that's and that's right. a time that's not uh, factored into that P3 calculation. So that was why we had to, everything scaled to account for that time spent that's not going to be covered. I was just doubling the price for a round trip. You, you were giving examples of a one way, right? Yep. So a round trip would be double the price of the examples you gave? Yep. I mean, again, assuming that you're able to go to North Commons Park, pick somebody up, bring them to City Hall, and somebody in City Hall jumps in and you go right back to North Commons Park, yes. Uh, okay. and in that case, that would be correct. And that, that, thank you for clarifying that because I'm wondering if as part of the study you've had, uh, do we have knowledge of how many riders come from low-income neighborhoods or, or – uh, the disabled community? Do we know what percentage? Because clearly higher prices will become a burden on them. Um, that's something I'd have. One, 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 I'd want to check with CPED on. I'm sure the city does um, have some of that. But in terms of the actual impact um, and how many utilize rideshare, uh, I think like that's. Uh, like, I'm happy to get back to you. Thank um, you. Yeah. Thank you, Ms. Thank you, Councilor Vita. Thank you, uh, Chair Chavez. I just had a couple quick questions. The first one is. I thought we did have data from Uber, like two week, like a two-week sample or something like that. Is it just not enough for us to look at? Yep, uh, Councilmember Vita, we do have we have two different samples of two weeks. Um, in the it's a graph that's included in the um, amended report. Yep. Um, and I think like the issue with that one is uh, again like while any data is helpful and informative, uh, with that one it does note that it's only calculated during a certain period of a driver's active status. So it's not, it's not incorporating P1, which is when you're logged into the app, but you're not actively transporting somebody. Um, and so looking at some of the other studies that were done, which again, like sometimes they're just based on driver surveys, so we're reliant on that because that, if that's our only source of data, um, like that can account for as much as you know 30 to 40% um, uh, like of an hour that a driver spends in active status is like is you're in that P1 status where you're either waiting um, to be dispatched for something or you know to have uh, to, or to be activated to go pick up a user you're getting gas, um, you're, you know, you stop to use the bathroom, you're, you know, doing, you're trying to figure, you know, you're taking time between rides to figure out, you know, where you're going to go next. Um, so the way that that was calculated, um, the data that the city was provided, um, it doesn't account for that time. So if you, if you factor in that time at the rate of, again, assuming that it's 30% or 40%, um, what you'd basically have to, you'd have to end up reducing um, the numbers on the graph uh, to account for that. So it, it does bring everything down um, a decent amount. There would certainly still be some, I should make that very clear. Um, that would be above, um, even even if we did account for that. But it's that's one where, again, absent knowing what that piece looks like, um, it's hard to use the data at face value. And so did we communicate that, that maybe we need something different than what we received? Um, I'm not sure what was communicated initially when CPED did their calculations. Um, I just went on the, the data that was made available just to, uh, again, with this one, to do the analysis of the work that had been done and kind of what factored into everything. I think that if, if the city is able to get more, um, it's certainly, you know, like that's something where I definitely encourage it. I mean, I'm just more interested in, you know, like us trying to collect data from Minneapolis because I read that Seattle um, – they their changes actually priced out a lot of their drivers and Minneapolis drivers make more than they do now because the laws that change there some drivers can't even take certain trips anymore or you know like it's just there's some different things that have been un unintended consequences of the law change so I don't know that I agree with Seattle being the comparable city to Minneapolis if Minneapolis is already making more money than the Seattle drivers after the, the change. So I would just, you know, want to see us work harder to get the information we need from these companies. If they, I mean, the meetings that I've had, they seem to want to work with us. I have not asked for specific data, but I'm happy to if we need to. I would just rather see what's happening here in Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. And then what is... Um, is the state's committee done now, or are they still planning to come out with more recommendations? Uh, Council Member Vita, my understanding of the state's committee is that that report was, I mean, they were put together with the intention of producing that report. Uh, I think I'd probably defer to our IGR um, people on whether or not there's going to be a new, a new version of that that's reconvened uh, to do anything. But, um, but with that one, again, then that, that report came out, I think that was, that was one of the final pieces that was being taken up, was figuring out if there was any agreement on compensation levels, and that was sort of where things seemed to 
you know, essentially just kind of dissipate and there just wasn't uh, like wasn't any agreement on it. So I do not know what the future holds to that group, but I know for you know the purposes of you know after issuing the veto, that was the governor's um, you know next step was to form them and have them come back and report before the end of the year. Um, so I, I believe I don't know if it was a f they were formally dissolved, but I think that that was that that report was kind of the culmination of the work that they were intended to do. So we don't know what could possibly happen this upcoming session with the report that um, the state generated. Uh, I, correct. I, I, again, I don't want to talk on or speak on behalf of you know the state legislature or anybody, but I think that it was what was indicated was that this issue would be very I think kind of very similar to what we're seeing here. Um, it was intended to be revisited by the next uh, during the next cycle um, by the House and Senate. Um, as far as how much, I mean, I mean, I don't believe anything in the. Although there's no minute or mile recommendations that were made in the report, um, I don't, you know, I, I don't believe that anything in the report is necessarily binding. It's meant to be informative, so it's possible that there's some pieces in there that the state adopts. Um, I also would expect that anything the state brings forward, just based on precedent in terms of what they did last term. Um, would include that compensation at a, um, at a per minute and per mile basis as well. And then again, you know, I, I'll defer to our city attorney as far as where that fits, at, you know, in terms of what we're doing at the same time, you know, and how those two can work, um, you know, like could or may work in tandem. Right, or they could somewhat, Mr. Chair, or someone could um, be working on something at the state. So maybe we should just like check in and see what the state is doing. And I think session starts next week or something like that. So maybe we should see what they're doing and like figure that out first. Uh, that's not a question. No, that, that's I'm okay. I, I, I mean, I, I should have, I, when I was doing my thank yous to, again, that staff that were helpful, I should have mentioned uh, Steve Huser from uh, IGR was very helpful with, um, he was our representative on that uh, committee. So I think if there's any questions about what the future looks like for them or what might be taken up, I think he's, he would definitely be a good starting point. Thank you. Yep. Councilmember Wansley. Thank you, uh, Chair Chavez. Also, thank you to our staff for um, really doing this work uh, to lay out very clearly how do we um, get rideshare drivers not to just a fair wage, but to minimum compensation on par with what we've already passed, um, which is a $15 minimum wage here, or $15.57, as you highlighted in the report. Um, it's also very clear of which models especially taking into consideration the compensation formula of P1, P2, P3, which are national standards um, and standards that actually you all, uh, along the legislative department, as well as executive staff, you've met with the national experts who have passed policies all across the country using that compensation formula. So that is the precedence that we built this compensation off of. So thank you for using, again, evidence and data uh, to get us to this place of how do we reach a minimum wage. Um, I did want to respond to a couple questions that were raised just to provide some clarification on things. So I know um, there was, for instance, uh, Council Member Osman, you raised the question around um, enforcement, which as a co-author, you're very aware the draft um, does include, and specifically the second ordinance, which would be fair rise, includes provisions around um, enforcement mechanisms where either right now we're working with the city attorneys to rework that language, but we're looking at either funding an enforcement arm internally or as we've done with other, you know, enforcement mechanisms like Homeline, outsourcing that to another vendor to support us in that um, aspect. So that is something that will be reflected um, in the ordinance. Right now, the ordinance has prefer preference that that enforcement will happen through a driver resource center, which is also on par, as you mentioned, uh, as other cities have, you know, created that as their enforcement arm. Um, as it also pertains to geography disputes, what's also laid out in the second ordinance is what is the arbitration process where drivers or riders can dispute, um, you know, claims or dispute rides? Um, and I just want to clarify, we're not creating a new arbitration process. This is what is already on the books that the TNC has. We're making it very clear what that process is. And also in the ordinance, it lays out provisions around deactivation. Because what we often know is many of the drivers who are overwhelmingly uh, black and immigrant, they are arbitrarily being deactivated and losing out on wages uh, when disputes come through. Um, so we also list those protocols out in the um, ordinance as well in alignment with 
the TNC's existing arbitration process. So I just wanted to note some things that's already considered in the ordinance around the enforcement piece. Um, kept hearing conversations about data um, in terms of what Uber and Lyft has provided or not. Um, as you highlighted, there is a precedence where most often the TNCs have not been provided uh, or providing this data. And it's not a matter of if you ask them nicely or not. Um, from my understanding, Uber and Lyft have been asked at the state level multiple times here at the city level. And actually, I'll pause there for a question um, for you, uh, Andrew. I want to highlight Model B, which is the mayor's proposal of, you know, the, the non-binding deal that he, you know, cooked up with Uber and Lyft or specifically Uber. Can you let me know if uh, Mayor Fry's office provided you additional data that backed those figures? Because I want to also uh, acknowledge the source where that data would come from, um, considering it was the mayor's office that recommended that compensation proposal. So did you get any additional data from Uber Lyft through the mayor's office around their proposal? Um, Councilmember Wansley, for Model B, uh, my discussions uh, with a representative from the mayor's office, uh, they provided the uh, graphs that were attached uh, from Uber as uh, some of the supportive data. And then it was also, um, again, like I, between both the mayor's office and IGR, um, I, th I believe that one, uh, like the, the kind of origin of that proposal was, I think, believe that was the one that was initially like floated that would, you know, um, by either Uber and Lyft or both at the state level, uh, kind of early on in that process that would be agreed to. Um, so I think that was sort of just a starting point um, for where that one had come from. But I, uh, beyond that, I, I know I don't have any additional um, information in terms of what the what all the calculations were that funneled up into it. Okay. So again, Mayor's office met with Uber and Lyft to get this information that they say they readily have and provided limited data that is considered in this report, saying, as you highlighted in the state engagement where Uber and Lyft was directly at the state table too. So this is the process that I believe Council Member Payne or Council President Payne, you mentioned of there is an incentive to, you know, not standardizing these wages. Um, and there's a reason why there's a withholding of information that will allow us to know what those figures are so we can regulate them. Um, but what I want to highlight again, which is in the ordinance, the second part, fair rides, we have a provision that ask or request TNCs to, to provide that data so we can do that ongoing tra uh, tracking that you mentioned. So that is, is once again already in the ordinance, the second one, fair rides. Um, I also wanted to respond to, again, Council Member Cashman, you mentioned some of the things around user um, impact, also around like market impact if uh, Uber and Lyft has been driven out of any other cities. I'll start with basically user impacts. I wanna highlight, we as a city, we don't get to dictate the pricing models of a private corporation, the TNCs. They get to set that. What I do know though is Uber last year earned $3 billion in profits. I know Lyft earned over a billion dollars in profits. They collectively have the ability to pay their drivers a $15 minimum wage here while also keeping their uh, rides affordable. Should they decide not to do that, that's at their discretion, but that doesn't stop us from being able to regulate and have them be in compliance with a policy that's already on the books that small businesses are already adhering to. So I just want to provide clarity on that piece. In terms of examples where uh, Uber and Lyft has left the city or left a place that's passed regulations, um, Austin, Texas is one. Um, they went forward to pass regulations, um, did the whole, we're gonna leave scare tactic, and they left. And what happened in their place is rideshare cooperatives formed because those drivers were able to just form uh, businesses to continue providing rideshare services because I do want to acknowledge there once was a world where these TNC companies did not exist. Um, and it's not that long ago. So they know how to do this work. So they formed businesses and they were very successful. So much so successful, the rideshare companies came back to the Texas state lawmakers, lobby them to preempt those cooperatives so that they can have a monopoly on the industry. So they came back. So I know drivers um, have mentioned being open and being willing to do the same um, initiatives here of starting their own businesses as they had done before Uber and Lyft even came into Minneapolis. Um, so I'm really excited on this body to you know hear how we can support those type of initiatives should we ever get there. 
Also, uh, this kind of relates to the question, uh, Council Member Rainville, in terms of uh, impact the communities around those that are disabled or low income. Again, this is also another dynamic where once we pass fair rise and we can actually mandate that these TNCs give us data, we can track that. Right now, we cannot track demographic information about where the rise and frequencies are happening. So that's another reason why we're including that data provision clause so that we can have more actual or accurate accounting of, you know, impacts on certain demographics. Um, and then I think that was the last, oh, state committee piece too. So um, in terms of the question around what happened with the state committee, they formed the report. Thank you, uh, Andrew, for highlighting that. They came through with the report, as you mentioned, could not come to an agreement of, around compensation specifically, even though they did agree it's a permanent per mile recommendation. Um, and that's it, because they're not a legislative body. They're, they're there to advise. What is kind of the space that they're in now is it's up to a lawmaker to introduce legislation. Um, and we've gotten updates from our IGR uh, rep, Steve, um, who highlighted as of now, there's been no legislation introduced. There's no knowledge of which lawmakers will step up, step up and do this. And once again, I heard this last year too of just wait, don't pass. The state got it. The state got it. The state didn't have it. And we have the opportunity to have it now um, and pass something that's evidence back, um, which is Model A. You made that very clear. That gets us close, closest to a $15 minimum wage, which is the standard. It's not doubling wages. It's not fair wages. It's getting to 15 and passing a compensation formula that gets us there. So I at least wanted to provide some clarification um, to some of the questions that were raised, um, in addition to just a thorough presentation that you've done that I know has happened in collaboration with uh, Mayor Fry's own staff of CPED, um, specifically the city attorney's office, um, public works. There's been, again, over several departments that really work to get us to this point to have an evidence-backed uh, policy that's in alignment with national standards. So I just wanted to thank you, Andrew. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Wansley. Uh, just to a point that you made, uh, one of the things I wanted to note that's not actually in the slides, but just in terms of looking at that uh, per minute, or the per minute rate is, is like, that's getting us to our minimum compensation. Um, in terms of actual wages and then looking at the per mile as you know that's that those intangible expenses um you know it, like and again i say this just to kind of point out that again in the absence of direct data you know we're going to pull data from where we're able to and where there's data that might be adjacent or similar uh for 2024 uh, the irs mileage compensation rates um are 67 cents per mile um if you so again like that's for individuals that are um, using their vehicle for business use um again like the assumption there is that that compensation is not related to what your wages or salary with that business are those that's simply related to what the wear and tear and you know cost of operating your own vehicle in that capacity would be if you consider that on the basis of p3 being the compensation model um you know like, like that we're looking at um again and ex extrapolating that so it's a 50 percent so you have to account for the other 50. um you can multiply that by two and that means that every mile that's um, undertaken by a driver um, for ride share would be compensated at that rate i think and again that's just a nationwide rate so it needs to be adjusted for again larger municipalities you know a lot of, a lot of other driving conditions but that 67 cents brings us to a dollar 34. Um, per mile. So again, for, for whatever um, additional context um, is helpful, I did want to make sure that I noted that um, just to use a national standard um, as far as how we're compensating. Thank you. A quick thing. Sorry, Chair. Go ahead, Council. My, no, yeah. Council Member Chwanzi. Andrew, I just want to also uh, mention, because you had the wheelchair accessibility thing yeah. um, listed in the slide too. I know that that was a provision that we included. I believe Council Member Jenkins brought that forward. So to note kind of the averages of incentive compensation and how that was reflected in this analysis too. Um, did you look at what's currently in the policy and how that is complementing like your own analysis around the wheelchair accessibility piece? Um, Council Member Wanzi, that's actually another good one um, like that I did want to call out where that was, it was something where uh, look, like kind of exploring the New York side uh, more in depth I think is was like a little bit like and I was trying to figure out how much it, it, it was in scope of what we were doing, um, but that, that's something that it wouldn't be that challenging to do. Um, and so I think we could definitely provide that because that, that is, I think, to this discussion, uh, worth noting that they have a higher rate of compensation. Um, I think, you know, mo primarily based on, I think there is, you know, a scarcity. Um, you know, again, like you have all the, you know, most people's, you know, normal vehicle that they're using for ride share you know, isn't wheelchair accessible. Um, so I think that it's it's a combination of incentivizing people, um, you know, having those vehicles, but also just their cost of operations generally higher. 
um, just based on the equipment that's necessary, um, you know, in order to facilitate that. So I think that um, it's probably a worthwhile um, a piece to figure out kind of, you know, what is the impact? Because if we're concerned about, you know, the compensation being different, like that's a specific one where New York's actually compensating at a higher rate. So is there, how is that, um, I think, essentially how is that compensation at an increased rate impacting that specific community, which like should be fairly carved out. So um, I'm, I'll be happy to look into that and follow up. Thank you, Councilmember Jenkins. Thank you, Chair Chavez. Um, you know, I've been advocating for a long time because I was very aware of Austin's um, cooperative models that drivers created their own TNCs, which I've been strongly suggesting to a number of our drivers in this community. Um, you know, why why fight with these companies when you can literally create your own because we do know how to do that. And um, I think people have been driving people around for, you know, I think in the early 1900s in black communities, they called them jitney drivers, you know. So this is not a new phenomenon. What is new is the technology aspect of it. And so um, that is one. You know, I'm very supportive of these measures, these um, proposed ordinances. I would really um, like to see a broader um, ordinance to cover this, a statewide, if you will, um, law ordinance that would help us to ensure that um, transportation network companies are paying their drivers a fair and livable wage. Um, short of that, you know, the city will likely have to, to make some changes to that, but um, I would really prefer to see a broader, and I am deeply concerned about the disability aspect this past weekend, I wanted to um, not use my vehicle, but I was not convinced that a driver would come and take my mobility device because they generally don't. Or if they come and they see you with the chair, they, they leave, they call another driver. Um, and so it's a really big challenge. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Jenkins. Councilmember Vita. Thank you, Chair Chavez. Just um, the, these drivers are independent drivers, right? They're like contractors. They don't work for uh, these companies. So I'm wondering what that looks like with having like a pay rate, like an hourly rate for a driver that would make them an employee. And they're not employees now, right? They're like listed as independent contractors. Uh, Councilmember Vita, I believe that's correct. They, uh, the status for brideshare drivers in most, uh, I think, at least in the state, I believe they're, um, like, tax-wise, they would be independent um, so, contractors. So. so have we had conversations with the drivers, that their coalition, where they're saying, like, I want to be, um, you know, like, I want to work for this company or I want to remain an independent contractor because, like, that's going to be the shift in the pay rate is, like, they will become employees. And do we know if this is something, I mean, I know some council members have uh, been having more conversations than others. Maybe council member Osman can answer, um, but like, do we know what they, what the goal is out of this? Because a certain rate means that they would be employees of ride share companies. I'll have uh, council member Wamsley was working with answer. Yeah, so there's no change to their classification status at the municipal level. They do not want to change from being independent contractors. In terms of classification, if that is something that happens, right now the AG's office has a task force right now that's working on larger you know, worker classification matters that also is looking at ride share. But right now, no. Compensation, we even have this on the books for, you mentioned DoorDash. Um, we did this a couple years ago at the municipal level in terms of, you know, in, impacting or raising compensation 
for independent or contractors that does not immediately move them into a full-time employee status. Now, if we were talking about coupling that with insurance, 401k, then we're a different situation. That's a statewide matter again. But there's nothing wrong with us, you know, taking on compensation for 1099 contractors at the local level right now. Hmm. Okay. That's news. Councilman Rita, do you want to, do you have more questions? No, or? I'm, okay. Okay. It, cool. it's news. I yeah. thought contracting was different than employee status. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Wanzi, was, are you back on cue or was that just to answer Councilman Rita's question? Yeah, that was that. Cool. Anybody else on cue? Nobody seems to be on cue. Okay. <laughs> thank you for that presentation, Andrew. Really appreciate it. And thank you for answering all the questions that we all had. <laughs> See no further discussion. I'll direct the clerk to file that report. Thank you. Uh, now on to item number three. It's a report relating to the Minnesota Workers' Compensation System. I will invite Emily Ann Colby from the Finance and Property Services and Greg Souter from the City Attorney's Office to give a presentation on this item. If I mispronounce names, please let me know. Good afternoon, um, Committee Chair Chavez, Vice Chair Chowdhury, and members of the Council. I am Assistant City Attorney Greg Sauter, and I am here with our Director of Risk Management, Emily Colby, and we're going to give you a presentation on the workers' comp system today. This is a public presentation. I have presented to you on workers' comp in the past when discussing individual lawsuits. So before I get started on this, I want to tell you a few things about this presentation today. We are not going to talk about legal strategy in a public environment here. We're not going to talk about anybody's individual injuries or personal medical data or any individual cases today. Next slide, please. So first of all, before workers' compensation was adopted during the Industrial Revolution, employees who were injured at work were subject to the tort system. In other words, they had to have an injury that was bad enough for them to sue their employer and try and get compensation. It, and the problem with this is there's a lot of injuries that are not particularly severe. There are a lot, and there are also a lot of injuries that, um, and within this, if the employee themselves did not um, contributed to their injury, there was no recovery. It led to workers getting hurt and not receiving compensation, and it had employers who didn't know when they had to pay for an injury or not. And, will, and when there were injuries they recovered for, um, that the employer, the employee recovered for, that were substantial. So therefore, in 1909, New York, Minnesota, and Wisconsin put together a committee to study this problem. Wisconsin was the first out of the gate in, in 1913 and adopted their workers' compensation law. And then Minnesota was, was shortly after them in 2013, 2011 and 2013. Next slide, please. Most workers' compensation systems follow three principles. It's a bargain between labor and employers, labor and capital. And the first issue is employees will recover for their injury regardless of fault. Even if the employee contributed to the employee's own injury, they are going to recover for that as long as it's work-related. Number two is the benefits available to those employees are limited. It does not include the pain and suffering and the other forms of recovery that one might get through the tort system that would send a recovery from an accident up very, very high. And three, it makes it the exclusive remedy. I, as an employee, if I'm um, hurt at work, if, if, I, if I worked for Public Works and dropped a uh, manhole cover on my toe, I couldn't sue the city of Minneapolis for that. It's, I would go through the workers' compensation system and get my recovery. Next slide, please. 
So the fundamental principle is, and it's written right into statute, and I've put that in front of you, is that every employer is liable to pay compensation in every case of personal injury or death of an employee arising out of and in the course of employment without regard to the question of negligence. To the extent I as an employee contribute to my own injury is not relevant. Physical injuries, disease, and PTSD for first responders, and that's been a challenge for the council and for the city over the last few years, are all covered by workers' compensation. Mental illnesses other than post-traumatic stress disorder are covered but only to the extent that they are caused by a physical injury that is received. Generally, the burden is on the employee to show that their injury is linked to work. In other words, did they receive the injury due to what they were doing at work? Were they doing it in the course of their employment? Very, and that is the general rule. But there are some exceptions. And the exceptions to li employer liability are two. The first one, which I have listed there at 176.011 subdivision 6, 16, is mental impairment that is caused or contributed by termination or disciplinary action. If somebody is angry or somebody claims that it was a traumatic event for them to be disciplined, we're not going to pay for that, and that is an exception there. And number two is injuries that are intentionally self-inflicted as or the result of intoxication. Those are the only exceptions in the law. Misconduct is not written into the law. So if somebody commits misconduct, it generally means that they will still recover. The focus is whether or not they have the injury and whether or not it's job related. The, facts that, the fact that an employee may have committed misconduct is generally irrelevant. I list here Cunnings versus City of, um, City of Hopkins, a case from back in 1960. And in that case, the employee was, was horsing around with other employees in a truck and fell out. It was his fault. He caused the accident. He was severely injured. And the Supreme Court of Minnesota said clearly that that misconduct was, was irrelevant and he um, was entitled to workers' compensation. I told you about the general rule, which was that generally an, um, uh, an employee needs to show that the injury is real and it happened in the, in the course and scope of employment. And that is the general rule for workers' comp compensation. But with regard to PTSD and first responders, the, um, the legislature has flipped that burden. At that point, with both cardiac conditions, some cancers, and that's for firefighters who are exposed to toxic chemicals, and for post-traumatic stress disorder, under the law, if an employee shows that they have that condition, it is the city's burden to prove that wrong. The inquiry works into two things. The city can challenge whether or not the diagnosis is correct or incorrect, or there's an alternate means of causation of that. That's, that is pretty much the full inquiry that happens in a contested issue on um, PTSD or um, cardiac condition. And now I'm going to cede the lectern to Emily. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, claims and how the city handles them. Um, the beginning of a claim, somebody, if an employee for the city is injured, they would file what's called an event report with my office, and I have staff that would review that, and those are adjusters, and they would make a determination if the uh, the injury is compensable. And if they determine that the injury is compensable, I want to talk a little bit about the types of compensation, the benefits that employees who are injured on the job are entitled to. And these benefits are all laid out in uh, the Minnesota statutes. Workers' comp law is very statutorily driven. It's very, um, it's a very regulated area, and it's very regimented. Um, so, the types of uh, benefits that are available, and this isn't absolutely everything, but these are the main cat categories. You get wage replacement. So if you're not working, you still get paid. Medical expenses are covered. There may be retraining if you need it, depending on the extent of your injury. 
Um, and if somebody, if there is a fatality, um, there are death and dependency uh, benefits available. Next slide. So wage replacement, they've made this a little complex, but there is, in the first period of your injury, if you are completely unable to work, you get what's called temporary total disability, and you get two-thirds of your average weekly wage, and you can get that paid for up to 130 weeks, um, or 90 days after termination that you have reached maximum medical improvement. And that's just when a doctor says, okay, you're not 100% back, but you're as good as you're gonna get. Um, so those, those benefits can go on, like I said, for 130 weeks. Once an employee starts back to work, whether it is under restriction, so you come back to work and they say, look, you can't work 40 hours a week, maybe you can work 30 hours a week or 20 hours a week, or you can't lift things anymore over a certain amount, so we put you in a light duty position um, and you're making less money, you can have temporary total disability, which again can be up to two-thirds of your average weekly wage, and that will extend for another 275 weeks. So as you can see, the Minnesota legislature is really pretty generous in determining what type of wage replacement is available and, and the length of it. Um, and you know, when you think about it, Minnesota was one of the first states to step forward and say, we need a workers' comp system. It's not tenable to have, to have um, employees have to sue their, sue their employer in state court, in, um, in district court. And um, I would say our, our system is fairly employer friendly. It is driven toward making sure people are compensated if they are injured at work. Another category of wage replacement would be permanent total disability. Now, if someone is unable to return to work um, at all, and they are judged to be permanently totally disabled, they will receive two-thirds of their average weekly wage up until the age of 72. And lastly, there's this category. It's not really wage replacement, but it's another type of payment you would get. Um, permanent partial disability, if you were to lose um, functional use of a body part or a body part, say I lose an arm or I lose the uh, use of my arm, eyes, legs, um, there are scheduled payments you, you would get, just like um, a disability insurance policy. Next slide. The next thing you would be entitled to, or the city will pay if you're injured on the job, is medical expenses. And it's defined as reasonable and necessary medical treatment or supplies. And unlike wage replacement, this is not capped either monetarily or durationally. So if you need a very expensive surgery, there's not a cap on that. If you are injured and 15 years from now you continue to have problems with your shoulder, we're gonna to continue to pay for that. Um, so it is different than the wage replacement in that way. Um, there is some control on cost because there are provider fee schedules, so providers can't just charge whatever. But durationally and monetarily, it's not like you get to the point where you're like, oh, we've paid $200,000 on this claim, we're done, we're out. That's not how, how the medical expense part works. Um, and when you have cases where somebody is permanently totally disabled, a family member may do some skilled nursing care for them and they can get reimbursed for them, that as well. Another possible benefit to injured employees that the city pays for is vocational training or retraining for individuals who are injured. If they're unable to return to their job, there may be training that allows them to um, return to a job that is similar or related to their job. And it also looks at returning people to something that will pay them about the same as what they were making before. Um, types of things we have paid for, um, get a trucking certificate, get a cyber risk um, uh, certificate. You may have to, depending on what happens, pay for additional schooling, including additional graduate or professional school. So vocational uh, rehabilitation uh, costs can, can get kind of pricey. 
And lastly, there are death and dependency benefits. Um, funeral costs up to $15,000. And then there is a formula, depending on the number of dependents an individual has, that will pay during those uh, dependence years through college, and then continue to pay the surviving spouse for another, for another 10 years. So I want to talk a little bit about our program. Um, the City of Minneapolis Workers' Comp Program, we are self-administered and self-insured. So the city sets aside money yearly based on an actuarial um, study, and then we administer it internally. This is instead of buying a workers' comp policy from an insurance company um, and having, having them do it. We have variable number of claims each year. Um, last year, we had a fairly low claim count. We had 391 claims. We had 590 in 2022. And then in 2020, which um, is when COVID started and we also had a very large number of PTSD claims, uh, my office handled 748 claims. So the number of claims we handle each year is variable and the types of claims we handle each year is variable. Right now, we're not seeing a lot of COVID, COVID claims. The presumption for COVID has been eliminated, um, so we're not getting those presumptive COVID claims. Um, the departments that file the most claims are exactly the ones you would, you would think would. They're the ones that have um, a lot of physical work. So public works, you get a lot of orthopedic injuries, you get slip and falls, um, police and fire, same. Um, those three departments make up the majority of injuries. Um, a very small number of these actually result in litigation. Um, the majority are accepted upon entry into my office, and we simply look at what is this person entitled to and what do we need to pay, and we pay that out over time, whether they come back to work in two weeks or six months or two years. Um, however, litigation may result when the city and a claimant dispute whether benefits are owed, so, uh, or the type and extent of benefits. So there is some number of cases that end up in litigation because we are disputing um, their injury or we are disputing the remedy needed. Uh, so when it goes to litigation, uh, it is referred to our outside counsel. At that point, there is discovery, which is the exchange of information about the case, the medical records, other pertinent data. And this is our opportunity, especially for disputing the type of injury, the extent of injuries, to have an independent medical examination or an independent psychiatric evaluation done of that person. That's where we get to choose a, an expert to meet with this person, evaluate this person, and say, yeah, I think they have this diagnosis, not the diagnosis given by their doctor. Sometimes our, our Docs will agree and say, yeah, we, that's actually a correct diagnosis. So it really depends, but that's our opportunity um, to, to evaluate the, the individual. And it should be noted that under Minnesota law, um, an employee injured at work is entitled to choose their own provider. So we're not choosing their providers for them, which is why being able to do an independent psychiatric evaluation or an independent medical examination uh, is so important. Other things that would happen in litigation, this is where negotiations and mediation would, would occur. It may go to hearing in front of the Office of Administrative Hearing. Um, and depending on the outcome of the hearing, they can then be appealed to the Minnesota Workers' Comp Court of Appeals and then to the Minnesota Supreme Court. But they don't start out in um, civil state court, they do start out in the Office of Administrative Hearing. Um, and obviously there's a lot of private information, private data, there's not a jury, um, and they're closed hearings. So settlements, um, this is what comes to you. As, as an end process of, of all of this, if it's litigated um, and we determine that there's a settlement involved, um, this is what you see. And although over the last couple years, a large percentage of these cases have PTS, been PTSD that have presented, been presented to you. Not all of them are. Um, you're gonna see orthopedic cases, you're gonna continue to see slip and fall cases and other things where um, you know, we have determined it's better to settle the case and end the claim than continue, 
continue to pay it or continue to dispute it. Um, the underlying claims all contain non-public data under Minnesota law, which is why when it's presented to you in a public forum, we're not discussing the particulars of, of the case. Um, and the primary reason for settlement is always that we are going to save money. What will happen is we will make, take, make an assessment of what do we think this is gonna cost us over time if we pay it out over the next several years and somebody needs surgeries and they're gonna be out of work um, for lengthy periods of time, et cetera. And if we determine that we can negotiate something that's gonna save the money, the city money over time, and that also saves our resources as well because we don't have people who are having to continue to administer it, um, we're going to engage in that settlement. Um, and that is really the primary goal of settlement is to move things along to save the city money and to save our resources and to move that claim off our books so we can continue to work on and assess other claims. Um, these settlements are usually the result of mediation, um, but some may be negotiated without a mediator. Um, those are usually the lower dollar ones, but usually in the types of cases we're using, there's a mediator um, that's running between the, the parties talking everybody into uh, what is going to be the final, the final number. So, you know, I think the question is in front, in front of us, um, has been asked, what happens if a settlement is not approved? You guys look at it and you say, we don't, we don't wish to approve this. There are a couple things that can happen. First of all, you know, it's still in litigation. That doesn't make it go away. So my office needs to decide what to do with it. And there's two likely paths. One is it's going to go to hearing and a judge is going to decide. And if the judge decides against us, we're going to have to pay whatever the judgment is to that point. And then we're also going to have an open claim that we're going to have to continue to administer over time. Um, or we could look at it um, and say, we just really can't win. We're just going to have to flip this claim and pay it over time rather than pay it as a settlement. So again, in our estimation in those, we would end up paying more over time. Um, which is, again, why we bring the settlements forward in, in the first place. Um, I think Greg has one more thing he wants to address, and then we'll take questions. Good afternoon again. The last thing I'd like to talk to you about today is the para-duty disability system, because it so often gets, when people hear about para-duty disability benefits, they get confused about them with workers' comp benefits, and they're two different systems. The workers' comp compensation system, we are a self-insured entity. It is City of Minneapolis money that is going to pay the employees who have been injured. Paraduty disability system, and this is state-created, is a, is, paraduty disability is a benefit allowed to first responders for injuries that come from their inherently dangerous duty, um, inherently dangerous duties that provides them benefits paid out of their pension fund. Now the city does go and contribute to that pension fund based on hours worked and so forth, but that's coming from a separate fund, not from city accounts. The way it impacts the city of Minneapolis is, and this has been, been it since it, the system started, is that when an employee is, is given duty disability, the city as the employer is required to provide health care benefits to that employee until they turn 65 or to their dependents until they would have turned 65 if they predecease their 65th birthday. And originally when it was created, the city was getting 100% compensation back from the state from the money that it provided. In recent years, that amount has shrunk for the compensation back from the state to, it was 30% for a while, it was 25%, and now we're in the teens and um, would have been about 10%. So what happened was that in 2023, the legislature changed the law because not only the city of Minneapolis was suffering under the burdens of paying for health care benefits as the wave of um, paraduty disability awards came through, but so were small entities, small towns, counties, and other entities throughout the state. And so now there's an, the benefit has been changed 
with regard to PTSD. But this benefit is available for any injury that prevents somebody from working. Um, I've litigated a hip injury where somebody had to have a hip re replaced on this. And um, for PTSD, before the first responder is allowed to actually, their application is accepted, they are now given tw initially 24, they must attend 24 weeks of treatment. They get to choose their treatment provider. Their insurance pays for the first part. The city pays for any difference between the cost of insurance. And the city, if the city follows and um, does certain things with its in employee assistant program and some training, the city will get paid back 100% of that, of its burden. And then it can be extended to eight more weeks, but then if they get the benefit, the city has to provide the health care because they get the same health care they had. And why would somebody think of a, why the city should provide it versus somebody else? Imagine if somebody worked for Blaine or, an, or a small town that didn't have as good a health care benefits as we are. The employee is entitled to the benefits at their employer they had when they left. And if we have, if the, the city has negotiated better benefits than others, their motivation would be to get the benefits from the city, and they get the same benefits as any other city employee gets. But once they get that, right now under the law, and assuming funding will come from the legislature going into the year's future, the city will get back 100% what it pays for those benefits. Um, they have to certify, the employee can be required for up to five years to certify that they still qualify for the benefits, and there's no workers' compensation offset. So if the employee is getting the duty disability benefits, that doesn't, that does, the fact that they may be receiving workers' comp does not change the benefit they get. We have thrown a lot at you in this presentation. We're ready to take some questions. <laughs> Thank you for that presentation, Emily and Greg. We do have a few members on queue, so our first call on Councilmember Ellison. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, and thank you all for this presentation. I think it's a really important topic, and um, you know, I think that you'd be hard pressed to find anyone up here who doesn't want to provide, uh, you know, exactly what our our workers deserve, especially in the event of an injury. Um, and uh, and while I'm glad that we went really broad, and and if I if at any point I'm getting too specific, I'll, uh, I'll I'll give the city attorney permission to like throw a stapler at me or something, maybe something softer. Uh, <laughs> but um, but also we know that this is an area where um, specifically PTSD claims are really hurting not only Minneapolis. I want to make that clear, but every city in the state of Minnesota. Um, the way that it's 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 going, um, and we don't know exactly. You know, we can hope for some level of plateau into the future, uh, but uh, but we don't know that for sure. And even if there is some plateau to to PTSD claims, uh, we've now just developed a new sort of cost of doing business, right? Like every city in the state has, right? Um, and so I wanted to sort of talk a little bit, to the extent that we can, a little bit about you know what we're facing there, what some potential remedies are there. Um, uh, uh, you know, or, you know, do cities in Minnesota just kind of have to resign themselves to like sort of a new cost of doing business when it comes to these claims? Um, one of the things, uh, I guess the first question I have is, uh, uh, you know, when a settlement comes before us, we only see the settlement. We vote yay or nay on that, uh, which means that the public only really sees the settlement, right? Uh, which is, which is kind of another way of saying that, uh, the public sees the money spent. They don't see the money saved, right? Uh, and, uh, and that creates, quite frankly, it creates a lot of pressure from constituents who are like, wow, we, we, we want you as our representatives to stop the excessive spending. Our taxpayer dollars just seem to be flowing out the city. Um, what is a way that the public can better, better understand this issue, or what is a way that council members can better articulate this dynamic? You know, how, how can we better uh, provide better information? So I can give you an example right now. I can't give you specifics from a case, but I can give you an example of what I would call a standard PTSD case going into mediation. Um, 
We generally get demands in those cases that run anywhere from about 385,000 to about 600,000. That's the very high end. 400 to 500 is really the range we get. My department will sit down and do an analysis of what we really think the exposure is. Now, as I told you, you know, the system is really driven um, very in a very regulated way. So a lot of that is, you know, this person is going to get $1,364 a week for the next 130 weeks and then for the next 275 they're going to get whatever the max rate is at that time that max rate is set by the state it's recalculated every year um, and you know it's it's simple math so a lot of what is in the demand comes close to what we really think the exposure is. And then when we, you know, we look at that, we're like, do we really think the claim is going to continue that long? You know, are we going to have to pay some sort of retraining? We also, in our minds, enter in costs like, is there going to be a rehab consultant put on it, which is going to cost us about $1,000 a month, even though that's money that doesn't go to the worker, it's money out of our pocket. Um, so we do those calculations, and I would say, um, and you know, this is just sort of averaging. My estimation is our average exposure, um, and you know, there's subjectivity to that, um, is in the high 300s. So when we're negotiating these down to 125 to 130,000. Um, maybe more, maybe less, depending on the strengths or weaknesses of the case. That's a considerable savings. We're also saving on attorney's expenses for our own attorneys. The other thing that you may have to pay is if we go to hearing and we lose, their attorney can ask for excessive fees and file a petition asking for more money. So legal costs can go up considerably. Where our attorneys, you know, we know what they make per hour for under our contract, which is not a lot. Their attorneys make a lot more per hour and can put in a fee petition for all the hours they put in. So we try to do an analysis of that. Um, sorry, I'm wandering. Thank you. Um, <laughs> we try to do an analysis of that, and we believe we are saving very significant money over time, as well as resources within my own department, not having to hire additional people, um, et cetera. And Thank I know that's not terribly satisfactory, but it, it, that's the best I can, can for do. For sure, for sure. I mean, it's plenty satisfactory from where, given the information that I know, but I also understand, yeah, the public doesn't always ha have uh, access to a lot of information. Uh, I'll try to keep these questions relatively quick. Um, um, what I think often folks wonder, you know, we also don't see those, uh, those cases that go to trial uh, I, you know, without getting specifics, I happen to know we don't have a lot of success there, but how can council members better understand, uh, uh, you know, or the public better understand um, how we might determine a case that will go to settlement versus a case that we think, hey, we should, tr we should, we should, we should take a chance on this one. Are, are you asking about what are the factors that would be different? Yeah, what might or? be some factors? Maybe that's, is that too broad of a question? You know, I think that might get a little into strategy that we don't Got want it. to disclose. But basically, you know, it's it's going to come down to the strength of the case. Mm -hmm. And um, our win-loss record, even on ones that we thought were really great to go on, has not been particularly good. Um, I I think this is not revealing too much, but there was one one claim where – I thought, there is no way we can lose this claim based on the admissions the person made, based on everything in there. And we did win, and the hearing officer actually wrote in it, this is the hardest decision I've ever made. So um, we are pushing a rock up a hill sure. with these. And some of that is the flipping of the presumption. Mm -hmm. It's very hard once they have presumed that it is work-related yep. to, to flip that back. Just very difficult. I'm, I'm sure I'm running up on my time here, but I have just a few more questions if I can about misconduct. Uh, and like the, just the, the, I know that uh, we talked about how misconduct can't be used uh, as, a, as, a, as a determining factor. Um, uh, but, you know, it was, 
it dawned on me that some sometimes what we're deba- often what we're debating up here as policymakers when we're looking at these cases is not necessarily whether the person injured themselves d- committing any misconduct, but whether or not they injured a member of the public in committing like that misconduct. Uh, and so, like, is there any? Uh, the example you gave was sort of people horsing around on the back of a truck and they injured themselves. Um, is 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 there any sort of change in the, in 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 that equation if that person's misconduct injured a member of the public? I think I know the answer, but I just thought I'd yeah. I think what I'd like to do is reach out to our council and get get a an answer on that. Yeah. The the short answer is no. Um, okay. But there are some particularities to that that I want to be able to give to you. Okay, cool. And then I I think I can add a little bit more more to that. Is PTSD in particular rarely comes from one event. So even if we can show, and I'm not even saying whether or not it would even be considered by the court, because in general, actions of misconduct are not be considered. But if we could show at this event on this day, this officer committed this, this bit of violence, that doesn't take into account every other trauma that they have experienced through their careers. Mm. Because officers, whether they're doing their job well or doing their job badly, they get, they, 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 they get find exposure. themselves in traumatic circumstances all the time. Mm-hmm. And when it comes down to it, PTSD is rarely one event. It, is a, it often is an accumulation of all of those events. Yeah. Um, last thing I'll say, and it's not even really a question, but just thank you guys again for this presentation. Uh, you know, I think the thing that can, that I can see to come back to is that is, uh, this, this is sort of a new expense, or at least from my vantage point, it feels like a new expense to our public safety system. Uh, it feels like a, like a, it feels like a pretty high burden for taxpayers to sort of take on and a very sudden one. Right. And that's not, Obviously, that's not you all's fault. That's not really our fault either. But it seems like a very new and sudden burden. The PTSD claims, the spike in them that we saw starting in 2020, not knowing exactly when it might plateau. I see. I know we're seeing a a, 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 a decline in the last three years. Um, but yeah, I, I, you know, just kind of wonder, like, given that this is a that this is something that the whole state is taking on obviously we want people to be compensated for their injuries whether those are physical injuries or mental injuries uh but we also want to make sure that there's a check and balance there that taxpayers aren't just saying okay spigot is open money's just going out the door uh which is which is how it can feel sometimes uh uh you know from our vantage point and i think from the vantage point of the public and so you know i I think that that's why this conversation is worthwhile i think that's why we have so many questions about you know how this system works and how we can you know uh uh more effectively um make decisions within this new sort of this new normal that we're entering into and asking questions about whether this is a new normal that we should just accept right um obviously people being compensated for mental injuries is something we should we should we should do uh but uh but in the way that it's happening now you know that i can see you to have some questions about how we might be able to improve you know while still giving people compensation for uh some remedy for whatever that their injury might be but also not uh in a way that just sort of uh opens up the floodgates and and leaves taxpayers and cities every municipality as far as i know in the state really exposed, highly exposed in this in this area. So that's all. Well, Council Member Ellison, one thing is what the legislature does has an impact. And from my understanding, PTSD was not compensable in the system until they changed the law. And then they changed the presumption. So it is new because the law is relatively new. I, it was in the late teens that the presumption was changed and before then in the early teens when the law was changed. And um, Emily here has the PTSD numbers going, going back, and they are changing over time. And they are, luckily, they're shrinking. I would let you talk about the numbers. Sure. I'll just give you a, a brief history. In 2020, which was our highest year, we had 148. Um, prior, prior to 2020, from 2013 to 2019, 2013 was when the law went into effect, to 2019, there were 30 total over that time. 2020, we had 148. That was clearly our highest year. 22, um, or 21 rather, we had 73. So it started to drop. 22 went down to 36. Last year, there were 19. 
this year we've had one filed. So the numbers are going down, but we do expect to continue to have a few of them annually. And whether that's more like the 19 from last year or maybe it's 12 this year, we just really don't know what that number is going to be over time. Right. Well, one thing I did want to add is so it is I am looking at those numbers going down and, think, and on one hand thinking, well, that's good. The number's going down, less money out the door, that's good. But also every city, every major city in the country has staffing shortages when it comes to their police departments as well, which in, and, and, you know, I don't think there's any city that wants that to just be the new standard, right? Like that they just got staffing shortages from now into perpetuity. Um, so in the event that there aren't staffing shortages, would those numbers then just, you know, sort of swing right back up? We don't know the answer to that, but, you know, it's, it's something that it's sort of a thought experiment in my mind of like, well, the low numbers might be a result of low, low staffing. Um, and if that's the case, then like there still might be the need for some sort of policy remedy here because, you know, in the event that those staffing shortages don't persist, uh, these numbers might rise again. So anyway, thank you all again for the information uh, and the conversation. Uh, City Attorney Anderson. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Ch Chavez and, and council members. And just to, to make the point abundantly clear, I know you all know this, but for the benefit of the public, public this whole system is a state creation, right? It's a, it's a state statute that requires what it requires, and this body doesn't, I mean, it's preempted, right? It's, it's not able to pass ordinances that would change the system or, or get relief for the city. So this really is a matter for the state legislature um, to, to think about and take up, and to the extent, I mean, I, I think you're right, uh, Council Member Ellison, that many, many cities across the state are, are kind of grappling with the same things that Minneapolis is grappling with, and that's really a, the state legislature needs to take a look at that and, and, and determine, you know, I'm not here to, to judge policy, it's up, but it is up this, to the state legislature. I, I do hope just in terms of, you know, there is so much, you know, secrecy around you know each of these claims not not secrecy in any sort of negative way i mean this is confidential medical information and we really can't talk about individual claims as they arise and from the public's perspective you know all you see is that the council votes on a settlement but i do hope that you know the benefit of having this presentation before this body is really to give um, the public an opportunity to understand what the system is how it affects the city and you know, I'm hoping that, that you all are able to, you know, when you get questions from constituents or when we do wind up having to vote on settlements in the future, be able to sort of cite back to this presentation so that people can, can review it um, if that's helpful for them to understand the context. Uh, thank you, City Attorney Anderson. Before I pass it to Councilmember Wansley and then Vice Chair Chowdhury and then myself, because I do have questions, I did want to remind folks that we have four, three items left to vote on. I do want to make sure we have enough time to get through the agenda today. Uh, if folks want to explore this further, I, I believe uh, uh, Councilmember Wansley can probably take this up in the AEO <coughs> committee under its jurisdiction. Uh, we did want to have an opportunity to have all 13 council members to be able to get this presentation and ask these questions, but uh, just wanted to let folks know that we are on a time crunch. Councilmember Wansley. Thank you, Chair Chavez. Thank you also for this presentation. I've noted for quite some time that this is a critical social safety net for workers, especially first responders, um, and also just wanted to make sure there are guardrails in place to ensure that this benefit is not being abused. Um, in light of that, in thinking of some of the concrete data points that you've already provided, um, can you share since 2020, what has the city paid out so far um, in relation to these claims? I can get that number for you. I tried to run that before this uh, meeting and I was getting some very strange returns from our system. I want to be accurate, so I will get that number to you as soon as I can get it run. Great. And then also on slide 12, you give an overview of the different uh, departments that typically submit these claims. Can you give a more specific breakdown in terms of ratios? And I'm thinking of, you know, from public works to police, like, yeah, do you have that breakdown? I can give that to you as well. I don't have it at my fingertips for this presentation. And I will request just, again, I think there was a really good uh, habit last term where uh, when staff reports back to uh, these questions, if you can also have it be shared to the entire committee. Um, with Absolutely. that, thank you. And then also, um, 
I see on slide 13, it's very clear when it comes to litigation, we typically outsource um, in that capacity. Can you remind me um, typically what's the scope of work for the contractors that we work with in regards to like litigation? So my department, well, the contract is owned by the city attorney's office, but there's a specific contract for workers comp work with our attorney, our attorney's office has three attorneys that work on them, and they work specifically for us on workers' comp litigation. So once somebody has filed a claim petition and the city receives that, that goes over to that attorney's office immediately, and they start doing the litigation work at that point, and that is the scope of their work. Okay, so outside counsel, what do you mean by that on slide 13 then? It, it seems like we're doing it in-house. Um, no. No, we have hired a, a firm outside of, of the city, so we have external counsel, and it is referred it is referred to them, and they do the litigation work. And the scope of work is just litigation related to claims exclusively? To workers' comp claims, yes. Okay, great. And then in terms of actually Councilmember Ellison raised some of these questions on going to slide five, where it's very clear employee misconduct is irrelevant when it comes to these claims. Um, I am wondering about how do we approach uh, specifically employees that do have a documented history of, of lying. Um, so just also thinking of uh, contractors or vendors, do, are we aware of any that support um, uh, litigating claims made by employees that do have a history of lying? And I wanna emphasize documented history of lying about events and actions um, while on city time. Uh, Councilmember Wansley, when it comes to actually trying a case and getting it before a hearing officer, the hearing officer will decide what element, what evidence is relevant or, or not. I am, I actually had a, had a conversation with our outside counsel um, within the last two days about that issue that you were discussing today, and they will present what information they can can present, but mm -hmm. it will be up to the determination of the hearing officer whether they will consider that information relevant and useful in making the determination. And quite often, the what is most relevant and useful is the, um, the report of the treating doctor. Because m especially with PTSD, the cases become a battle of experts. We have our independent doctor who may have seen the officer once or maybe twice that has one opinion. Then, then you have the treating doctor who has another opinion, and they have the they have the advantage of both primacy and recency, and also just duration of looking at that officer. Now, when it comes down to it, they also um, they too are looking for malingerers, and they have said in their professional opinion that this person has the medical condition they say. So, when it comes down to it, you add that to the burden. Even when we know that somebody has a, um, that, that there are allegations of untruthfulness of this officer or not, uh, it's very limited on what can come in. The same thing goes if I go and take a court, a case into federal court or into state court. What information I can actually go and uh, point to is limited by the law and that's usually taken care of with uh, motions in limine ahead of time. He is trying to get in, our, our outside counsel is trying to get in as much as they can on these cases when that evidence exists, but it doesn't necessarily mean it will be heard. Okay, and just thinking of, um, and I'll follow up with you on this one, but Minnesota statute uh, 176.178, where it specifically talks about this as regards to workers' compensation and those that have the intent to defraud or, you know, misstate or misrepresent or fail to disclose things. Just thinking of there are some statutes that it seems like maybe we could talk more around, like, how does that lend itself to specifically employees, again, that has that particular history. Um, but I'll follow up with you all on that. And then in regards to um, the the doctors that an officer has access to basically is that a list that they are provided or can they um or have the discretion to work with any doctor when it comes to verifying their claim of ptsd um just like you if you went in for a workplace injury you can go to they can go to any doctor they wish to go to okay so there is no list there's no trends of certain doctors that we're seeing to verify 
these particular claims. On uh, Councilmember Wansley, on the other hand, <laughs> of course they go, it, it, it is our experience that they go to the doctor that their attorney recommends. Mm, okay, awesome. That's all the questions I have. Thank you, Vice Chair Chowdhury. Thank you, Chair Chavez. Uh, I'm just getting on cue to let you know that I'm gonna reach out with some of the questions that I have. Um, it's related to the numbers um, around how much uh, money that this has cost the city and then breaking it down between how much we've settled and what we've lit litigated and how much that cost us. I just wanna get a better picture, um, potentially from when the law change was made in 2018. Um, I know we probably, it's safe to assume we saw our peak between 2020, 2021, and 2022. So I'll reach out on that, and then there are some other questions that I had around duty disability that I'll send, and we can have shared to the rest of the body. Thank you so much for the presentation. Thank you, Vice Chair Chaudhary. I'll also be reaching out for my questions, but just for the public to know, it's regarding page six that it says the city's, it's the city's burden to prove that either the diagnosis is incorrect or an alternate event uh, caused the condition. I just want to know if you know how many times we as a city have challenged one of these claims, but I'll reach out offline. That also might be a closed session kind of conversation, not something we can discuss in the public. So um, just information my office really wants to know how many times we've challenged some of these claims. Um, can, can, um, Chair Chavez, when we litigate cases, we're challenging the claim. It doesn't mean that every claim we've challenged makes it all the way to hearing. And I believe that uh, Ms. Colby can give you the number of hearings we've had. Perfect. <laughs> I will have to double check oh, that. It's around 15 okay. um, that we've actually taken to hearing. But any time that we deny a claim and it goes into litigation via a claim petition, we are at, an, at least, you know, implying or saying out loud that, yeah, we don't, we don't believe you have this diagnosis or we don't believe you have it to the extent that you have. Okay. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Uh, well, thank you, Emily and Greg, for the presentation. Seeing no further discussion, I double checked. Uh, I'll direct the clerk to file that report. Now we're going on to uh, discussion item number four and five. We're going to take items number four and five together as they are closely related. Item number four directs the city attorney's office to prepare a draft ordinance on the ballot initiative power to be referred to electorate at the 2024 general municipal election scheduled for Tuesday, November 5th, 2024. And item number five is a legislative directive regarding an analysis of municipal policies, both statewide and nationally, related to the use of resident ballot initiatives. I'll invite the clerk and Councilmember Wansley as well to speak on these items, but we'll start with you, Clerk Call. Uh, Mr. Chair, I was here to talk more about I process and timelines yeah. and would certainly <laughs> cede to Councilmember Wansley, who gave notice at the last meeting res, uh, related to this proposed amendment to the city charter uh, and the direction of having that drafted up by the city attorney's office. So. Oh, no, I actually thought you were coming up to talk about item six. So if you want to give the timeline, sure, that's fine. <laughs> Yeah, so <clears throat> under the statute 410.12 subdivision 5, of course, the city council can submit to voters a proposed amendment to the city charter. Um, notice was given, as we are aware, in the last cycle it will come forward for formal introduction and first reading referral uh, this Thursday. And then, of course, getting through the legislative process means bringing forward the ordinance that would amend the charter in its full up to a final vote. It has to then be referred to the charter commission for its review. The charter commission has a total of up to not to exceed 150 days to review that proposal and respond back. Uh, the statutory deadline is firm that 74 days before the date of the general election, the ballot language must be submitted to the county auditor to be included on the ballot. Uh, that deadline set by state law is Friday, August 23rd. So between now and that deadline, the council will have the ability to shape and form the ordinance that would amend the charter and the resolution that submits the ballot language to the voters. I'm happy to respond to any questions generally about the timeline or process. If any member has questions, oh, City Attorney Anderson. Um, uh, Chair Chavez, Council Member Wansley, I, I actually do have a question seeing that this is a, the staff directive to the City Attorney's Office. So um, the, the line item talks about initiative and referendum and then the directive just talks about initiative and I'm just wondering, are you 
uh, moving forward with both initiative and referendum initiative being essentially we, we changed the charter to allow for um, the electorate to propose an ordinance that's initiative and then referendum is actually the uh, ability of the electorate to um, take one of the ordinances that this body passed and that the mayor approved and, and put it to the voters on whether to approve it or disapprove it. Do you, do you want us to go forward with drafting both or, or just the initiative? Um, it could have been my understanding of seeing them interchangeable. I think what's in alignment of what is on the books for St. Paul, as we've talked about, and that's listed in item number five that we'll get presentations on. But I think what's the legal setting or legal presence for St. Paul and the 70 other cities, which if it's referendum, that would be great. Yeah, um, they both yeah. have, or St. Paul has both. Yeah, yep. so I think okay. both will be fine. Great. Thank you. Councilman Wansley, do you have a motion regarding item number four? I have a motion, uh, yes, that builds on item number four. Item number five um, is a legislative motion that directs the policy and research division to present research on how the ballot initiative and re referendum processes work um, or operate either in St. Paul, in Duluth, or other municipalities um, that also have this uh, power um, as a point of comparison. So that's to just give this body more context as we work through the ordinance. Great, thank you, Councilmember Wansi. Uh, Councilmember Wansi has moved item number four. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? And we'll call the roll on item number four. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Wansley. Aye. Rainville is absent. Vita <clears throat> is absent. Ellison. Aye. Osman is absent. Cashman. Aye. Jenkins? Aye. Chugtai? Aye. Koski? Aye. Palmasano? No. Chow Vice Chair Chowdhury? Aye. Chair Chavez? Aye. There are nine ayes and one nay. That carries, and item number four is approved. Councilmember Wansley, do you have a motion regarding item number five? Yeah, I just gave some context about that one, so I'll move for approval. Perfect. Is there a second? Second. Is there a discussion? Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Wansley. Aye. Ellison. Aye. Cashman. Aye. Jenkins. Aye. Chugtai. Aye. Koski. Aye. Palmasano. Aye. Vice Chair Chowdhury. Aye. Chair Chavez. Aye. There are 10 ayes. That carries and item number five is approved. Now we're going on to discussion number six. Item number six is regarding expired ordinances and resolutions from the last term. I'll invite the city clerk, Casey Carl, to present. It's hard to hear you. Um, the ordinances, resolutions, and actions that were introduced in the last term, 2022-2023, are set to expire unless they are reintroduced and re-referred. A list has been circulated and shared with all members. I've had a few more updates even today. My goal is to submit to the body a final draft of that list of actions to be reintroduced this term by close of business today so that it can be published with the agenda for the council meeting tomorrow. Uh, happy to respond to questions. This is a routine action that uh, comes out of the council's organizational meeting at the beginning of each new term. Thank you for that. Uh, Clerk Carl, I'll approve this item. Do I have a second? Do I, I have any discussion on this item? Council member, uh, Council Vice President Chuck Tai. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Clerk, I just want to clarify or reiterate uh, perhaps what you just stated regarding the expired ordinances and um, the, the expired ordinances list. So it, I know there are a number of uh, ordinances that are expiring, that have expired, that are set to be reintroduced, um, that, are, that are carryovers from the term prior to the last one. Um, so would you just, if, if there, if any one of us here 
um, has our name on an expired ordinance that you know has been there throughout all of last term and perhaps was open in the term before that. And uh, we don't currently have any plans of advancing policy on that matter. Um, to clarify, we should contact you before close of business today, making you aware of that so it can just expire. Uh, through the chair, council vice president, uh, maybe the opposite. If there is anything on that list that you do want definitively reintroduced, um, what I'll bring forward to full council on Thursday for awareness of the body is a list, the same list that was brought forward at your organizational meeting. Um, those items that are bolded and have um, a notation of which committee in the current organizational structure they'd be referred to would then be reintroduced and referred in the next cycle. Those that are not bolded, that don't have an identification of a committee, then will expire and will not be active. If that same subject matter, however, needs to be reintroduced, the council always has the ability to give notice and go through the standard process to reintroduce that subject matter. Otherwise, it would be expired. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Council Vice President Chuck Ty. Thank you, Clerk Carl. Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll. Council Member Payne. Aye. Wansley. Aye. Rainville. Not here. Um, Ellis, Ellison. Aye. Cashman. Aye. Jenkins. Aye. Chuck Ty. Aye. Koski. Aye. Palmasano. Aye. Vice Chair Chowdhury. Aye. Chair Chavez. Aye. There are 10 ayes. Thank you. That carries and item number six is approved. Thank you so much. Next, we'll receive the reports from the standing committees on matters to be considered by the full council Thursday. I'll begin with the chair of the Administration and Enterprise Oversight Committee, Council Member Wansley. Uh, Chair Chavez, just in the interest of time, I can like channel former council member Goodman's uh, approach and just do like we have 20 items to bring forward. Is that okay? <laughs> awesome. Well, the AO committee is bringing forward 20 items for approval. If there's any questions on them, please feel free to get in the queue. <laughs> Thank you, Councilmember Wansley. Uh, budget, uh, Council Vice President Chuck Tai for budget. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. The Budget Committee is bringing forward one item uh, to this Thursday's Council meeting. Um, all of us were at Thursday's Budget Committee, and so if there are further questions about that, I'm happy to take them now. Thank you, Council Vice President. I'll pass it to the Vice Chair of the Business, Housing, and Zoning Committee, Council Member Ellison. <clears throat> thank you, Chair. Uh, we've got um, a couple of new liquor licenses, um, mayoral appointments to the Planning Commission, uh, a number of complex quasi judicials that uh, if, I'm happy to answer any questions about if folks have them. Um, and then we have liquor licenses, liquor license approvals, renewals, gambling license approvals, um, and, uh, and items 11 and 12 um, were either grants, art commission appointments. Happy to stand for any questions. Thank you so much, Councilmember Ellison. I'll pass it to the Chair of the Climate Infrastructure Committee, Councilmember Cashman. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. So the Climate Infrastructure Committee has nine items um, for Thursday's council meeting, which I will read. One is a grant application for 2024 Rebuilding American Infrastructure with Sustainability and Equity raise uh, for First Avenue North Reconstruction Project. Number two is grant application to the U.S. Department of Transportation for the 2023 through 2026 Bridge Investment Program. Three is Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, IIJA, technical assistance grant for the Nicollet Avenue Bridge over Minnehaha Creek project. Number four is First Avenue South, which goes from Lake Street West to Franklin Avenue Street Reconstruction Project, uh, Street Reconstruction Project project designation cost estimate and setting public hearing. Number five is 42nd Street East, 11th Avenue South and near North Central Residential Street resurfacing program, project designation, cost estimate and setting public hearings. Number six, Beltrami and Monroe Residential and 50th Street East West Street resurfacing program, project de uh, designation, cost estimate and setting public hearings. Seven, Whittier North Residential, Douglas North Residential, and 29th Avenue Northeast uh, Street Resurfacing Program. Eight, the Community Environmental Advisory Commission appointments. And number nine, Secure Bike Parking Pilot Program. 
we'll stand for questions on, this, on these items. Thank you, Councilmember Cashman. Uh, now I'll pass it to the Vice Chair of the Public Health and Safety Committee, Councilmember Wansley. Thank you, Chair Chavez. Just uh, quickly for the AO uh, committee report, I do want to correct for the public comment. I think I said there was 20 items. There's 11 items. Thank you. All right. So for Public Health and Safety uh, Committee, we have, Lord Jesus, no, I'm struggling. I'm sorry, y'all. Actually, AO, that was right. 20. I'm looking at the wrong agendas. Yes, so AO was correct. PHS is 11 items. I move those for approval. Any questions? <laughs> Thank you, Councilmember <laughs> Wansley. Uh, with that, we've concluded all business to come before the committee with 12, well, actually 10 minutes left. And hearing no objections, I will declare this meeting adjourned. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>